ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ ಆಗಿ
हेलो
ഹലോ കട്ടി സർ നമസ്തേ കട്ടി സർ എം ഐ ഓഡിബിൾ യെസ് സർ യു ആർ ഓഡിബിൾ സർ സർ പ്രസാദ് സർ ഹാസ് ജോയിൻഡ് യെസ് സർ വെൽക്കം പ്രസാദ് സർ പ്രസാദ് സർ വെൽക്കം Good morning to all of you. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Sir, shall we start? Yes, yes, we can go ahead. Good morning, sir. Very good morning to all of you. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Uh, very good morning to everyone i welcome you all to the gnaneshana 2021 day 2 an e workshop on research methods and biostatistics jointly organized by government ayurveda medical college bengaluru government ayurveda medical college mysuru and sarnath government ayurveda medical college ballari to begin our today scientific sessions i'll call dr priyanka second year pg scholar the department of kaya chikitsa gmc mysore to invoke the god and start the prayer namami dhanvantaram ആദിദേവ സുരാസുരൈ വന്ദിതപാദപ്പദ്മോകേജരാരുഭയമൃത്യുനാശം ദാതാരമേശം വിവിധോഷദീന സംവ്യോമവാതാവനിവാരിവഹ്നി പഞ്ച പ്രപഞ്ചാത്മകദേഹം സന്താപ സമ്പാത ജരാജ്വരാന്തകം നമാമി ധന്വന്തരിം ആദിദേവ dr priyanka now we will move on to hear keynote address about renowned person dr v s prasad sir i request dr veena kulkarni madam to take over the proceedings of keynote address thank you kavya uh, namaste a uh, very good morning to one and all uh, it gives me an immense pleasure and happiness to introduce our today's keynote speaker he who is indeed a key player dr b shrinivas prasad dr budur shrinivas prasad sir was born on 2nd august in 1966 at tirupati he completed his graduation from sv university tirupati in 1990 and further completed his post graduation from uh, vijayawada in uh, kc subject 
sir took over phd in ayurveda from gujarat ayurveda university jamnagar in the year 1997 with specialization in male infertility and topic entitled is a clinical study on suvarna basma and vajikarna drugs on shukra dushti with special reference to male infertility under his able leadership kls bm kankanwadi ayurveda medical college uh, has become a leading and aspiring institute in all over the india sir has guided many phd scholars and guided many uh, more than some 15 md scholars he has also co guided md scholars sir has worked as research officer in central research institute of ayurveda uh, central Inst- central research institute ayurveda branch of ccrs at mumbai he has worked as research fellow in vajikarna section department of kaya chikitsa igpt and ra uh, at jamnagar sir was uh, in charge in central research laboratory andrologist vajikarna specialty in sdm college of ayurveda and hospital hasan sir was also principal investigator for aish funded rlhd project sir has established a central research laboratory with advanced facilities of drug testing and standardization and micro in collaboration with various research institute and pharma companies for initiating research activities in the institution sir had developed a methodology for rato pariksha that is semen analysis as per principles of ayurveda he has also standardized uttara basti procedure established panchakarma veshagara in institution sir is instrumental for nac and nabh accreditation of kelus bmk ayurveda mahavidyalaya and ayurveda hospital when he was principal of that college sir has many awards and honors to his account sir was awarded with ayurveda ratna in 2008 by international academy of ayurveda physician for his outstanding performance in development of ayurveda and vajikarna in the year 2008 sir was also awarded with teacher of the teachers award for the year 2014 by kelly university belgaum ayurveda shri sammana 2013 award by vishwa ayurveda mission uh, was also awarded to sir sir was awarded with the best teacher award for the year 2012-13 by kelly university belgaum he was also ccim member uh, from the period 2011 to 2014 sir was also member of board of management kelly university belgaum karnataka sir has published more than 70 publications and he has also presented more than 150 papers uh, paper presentations to his account sir has recently been elected as president of board of ayurveda national commission for indian system of medicine new delhi which is one more additional feather to his crown with this brief introduction i welcome you and i request you to enlighten us with your innovative ideas on research uh, warm welcome sir thank you dr veena so nice to see you after long time thank you sir thank you sir thank you so much sir it's oh, a pleasure sir it's pleasure you know you are progressing very well thank you sir thank you very much sir it's all your blessing sir and also let me compliment the all the organizers for arranging the good activities with the need of the hour all the pg phd students require research methodology and the uh, statistics and the guidelines on the very uh, how to conduct research is very, very important and also publications with the need of the hour Where uh, the government of India also wanting scientific publications, where government is unable to support Irish sector because of lack of proper evidence, it is the need of the hour. I must compliment Dr. Rahul Sharma and all the Dr. Shiva sir and other uh, unpatty also is here and all the organizers who are all instrumental in shaping the program, a meaningful program. So I'm sorry I could never I could not able to stick on the timings. I had to reschedule it. I'm also uh, uh, sorry for the even Dr. Uh, Supriya Balerao. She has to readjust her schedule twice. One as I had emergency meeting at one o'clock. I had to postpone the my talk. Uh, anyway, so with the compliments, I I'll go to the my talk. Uh, I'll make a slash slash uh, presentations.
I thought I will talk on the success story. It is a quality improvement in research, a success story. So where I could able to implement and able to achieve some growth and some success that I want to share. It is a live example where we can plan, how we can plan it, how we can improve the quality in the research in Ayurveda. That's what I want to share it. Coming to the KNG Ayur world, the, then that means 2006 I joined the institution and now to the 2021 I left the institution. Anyway, during the last 15 years, how the institute has progressed. Really. So this I have a glimpse I, I will show you. But at that time there is no publications. Now the publications in index journals is the most important thing is in the maybe PubMed or the Scopus Web of Science, etc. These are the important aspect. And then there was a rich output. Rich uh, that the dissertations are going on, but there is no output. Now we have three patents and four to five proprietary products we have brought into the market or into the usage. There is a broadly, there are many things are there, but the major things are three patents. We could able to have apply for patents and got the patents for free and able to bring out products four to five. There is no fund, research fund available in the institution. Then we got even government sponsored projects, almost uh, three projects of uh, each one crore work. Industry sponsored projects are near more than one crore. The university sponsored projects, the departmental projects also. These are the various funds we will raise for the support the research. And then there is no risk empowerment in the PG or staff to staff at that time. Now even any students are involved in the research. That way we can imagine now how much uh, the sensitization or temperament has been increased in the campus. No collaborations. Now we have more than 20 active collaborations. So collaborations, they again you say they will be in the shelf available in the book form or we can have active collaborations, I can say. And there's no research policy at that time. Now we have well-established research policy. And then poor research facilities. There's no facilities at that time. People used to run here and there for the facilities. Now we have well-established central research facility which offers the many services to the students. These are glimpses of that. This way I can show that in the 15 years, we were able to bring out a lot of changes. Uh, I'll show how we brought out the changes also. I'll give you all the, uh, the activities of research activities. What I identified is these the following list of the components are important for quality of research or successful research. So we have scholar, research guide, research topic, scientific writing skills, institutional research ecosystem, financial resources, research collaborations, research ethics, Anyways, we are, technical talks are being given by so many uh, stalwarts are there, resource persons or experts are going to deliver the lectures on the specific topics. I'm going to give the overview about the, how it can all be integrated and bring it to the, practic uh, the practical way, how it can be implemented and to bring it out uh, outcome based or translational research. That's what I want to share with you. Next. A bit of research scholar. So many times it happens that people join for to get a degree, but here uh, we should not think only for getting degree, but for innovation. Unless until the research scholar think of innovation, they cannot bring out a, the out, uh, outcome based on translational research. If you think of to get just a degree, they will not have any innovation. So he should think of innovation, then only he can make a translational research. And then ready to adopt and acquire. So they should be adaptable the newer technology, newer methodology, newer attitudes, and then the new the scientific the developments. These are we need to adopt and acquire. So we should be ready to adopt it. So we can't say that when the house has grown up in the same manner, I don't want to change. Unless until we adopt the newer, latest technologies, we can't go for the advanced research. The ready to face challenges. In the research, we have a lot of challenges come there. It will not be a smooth sailing. So we should be faced to uh, ready to face challenges unless until we are uh, face challenges and then we'll become stronger as the more challenge you face it the more stronger you become the more expert you become it so we should be ready to face challenges let us fa face a challenge i will overcome it with that motto we have to face challenges then constant persuasion so we have a lot of problems comes here if you fed up and change your topic and you cannot complete any topic there any topic you take there is a problem comes there so we should have constant persuasions. So we have to have a, a, the approach here and there. If not one option, go to second option, go to third option, go to fourth option. Likewise, you should have persuasions. Then only you'll be able to succeed in the research. 
otherwise it will be never ending the process will be there what i did in the kle is one is research sensitization during samskara varnish program we have varnish program called samskara nearly for a month is there in that one we go for research sensitization of the all the scholars there that, is, that has helped a lot for us to sensitize the students to the uniform way and then orientation of research policies and the, uh, the all the students also when you have policy in the institution unless and until students know what are the policies there how to follow it how to conduct research research they can't do it so now we have oriented the what are the policies we have how they can use the policies the student orientation then students have easy access to the, all the facilities there and then various workshops at different levels maybe first year second year third year and to which branch require what type of activity uh, uh, maybe training so those workshops are being conducted at different levels of the pg course and then six monthly progress review so we have a system of once the uh, topic is approved then the student will go for the chapter division and work plan the timelines and then those timelines are freezed by the signature of the guide and hod and then as a principal i used to see six monthly how much progress has been made as per their timelines which has been set by scholar and guide themselves only so what are the how much six monthly what you have projected what you achieved it so that progress review helped us a lot to have timely progress there is no accumulation of the work there and then students are asked to do the research appropriately and then we have make it mandatory gcp glp gmp uh, the training the workshops for the all the scholars so that they know very well the clinical the, uh, the good practices laboratory practices manufacturing practices all they know very well, familiar that one yes. then this is a guide coming to guide i say that one we should not be by default become guide we should become the guide by expertise so we should be expert in the field and thorough with the research thorough with the knowledge thorough with the research gaps where to identify where uh, which are the areas of the knowledge gaps are there how to fill up the gaps that way the guide should be thorough but generally by default he is become three after three years he become guide reader two students can be guide the professor three students can be guided so now we have system of uh, maybe some departments have senior the rank wise first rank go to hod second rank to reader likewise but here we have to expertise a student should choose i am interested in this area i want to opt this guide so that should be the research guide otherwise is a meaningless to have by default you become a guide and you don't know what you want to guide or you are forcing a student to guide in this respective area so this is important aspect there then familiar with the research advances so the same person has to be familiar with the research advances what are the advances happening in the scientific world he should acquire those advances and so that he can uh, guide the student accordingly and then he must have dialogue between interdepartmental and interdisciplinary so unless until each department because this is a team work research is team work maybe uh, the clinical departments want to have help of ravi guna or rashya sabhaj kalpana or rogridana likewise a guide should have dialogue with other department and then frame the framework and then give the students so that they can easily do that one or it may be a football the guide tell to go and meet somebody they get somebody again guy student come back again go to somebody else it will be football game only student will suffer a lot so the i always request the guides to have a dialogue between the both the counterparts and then tell the student you do this way activity then it will be easy for the student to perform otherwise students will be fed up with that one and they will be the harassment will be there for the students also similar way interdisciplinary so we unless until we have interdisciplinary approach we can't have innovation the modern science they have a lot of innovation maybe you can say it takes take it up uh, x ray ecg mri etc physics and medicine and then electronics and medicine software and medicine likewise if they don't join the two different streams we cannot have innovations maybe biochemistry microbiology by informatics all these sciences are joined together for the medicine so we need to embrace all the systems so that we can have innovations in our research in our college in the clinic college we made mandatory of nptel course on research methodology uh, by icmr being offered that one so this will be make it mandatory for every guide all pg guides in the college are are qualified in this course then we have collaborative meetings so we have interdepartmental meetings also before we go for the new synopsis uh, the taking up we call all departments and what they want what they already carried out which to be taken forward 
which department has to collaborate, like we will have a meetings there. So that each department know what is their role, how they can take it further, etc. So like we should have a collaborative meeting should be there, maybe inter-department or interdisciplinary also. And then visit the collaborators and advanced centers there. So we make the guides which are taking newer topics. Like they can visit the collaborators or advanced centers and get acquired, get advanced knowledge and come back so that they can get appropriate to the students also. And then we have assigned first areas of research for each guide. One, for example, in Panchakarma. One person there will be assigned for the Panja Vamana. So he will be continuously doing a Vamana only. So one year Vamana, another year go to the maybe Virechana, other year Basti. So you want to have every area. But he can't expertise in that area. So we see we made first series of research so that one person working on Vamana, he'll continuously work for Vamana. After 10 years, he can become mastery in that one. Then real innovation takes place in that one. He can bring out the protocols. So that way we have made first areas in the research for each guide type. So that's all helped a lot for us to have a in-depth research. So coming to these topics, of course, this is very, very wide. You are being going to cover by different uh, specialists on that one, but I'll give you a general uh, outlook only here. So not it has been studied. Most of the times, students bring the topic that one said is no, nobody studied this formulation. Nobody studied on this drug and like whether. So that is not the criteria. But we have to have filling up the filling up of the, the knowledge gaps. So that should be there. So we need to think of always how to fill up the knowledge gaps. What are the knowledge gaps in that one? How to fill up that one? So then only that became a meaningful research. So the research should be outcome based or translational research or social impact. So this should be the common motto. At the end of the research, we should have social impact or translation to a product or instrument or some technology, something else, or it can create some outcome, maybe a protocol developed it, or some fitness certificate developed it. So it something, something should be outcome should be there. So that should be thinking in your brain, not just the, the drug has studied, I want to study the drug only. So that will not be a, a good research. Then a thorough literature review. Before you take a any topic, we should go thorough literature search. So million, million people think that they are not be studied. But when you go for research uh, literature search, there are many works have been carried out by many people there. So we need to go for thorough search, literature search, so that we don't duplicate the work only. It is going to refine your work. So you, then you will be knowing what work has been carried out and then what to be taken forward. So we need to go for thorough literature search, review or review. So what we did that daily is institutional first areas. Even for institutional, whole institution, department-wise, we had identified first areas. So that department focus on that area, then there will be output will be there. Because think of the, the collection of data, we have improper collection of the data that cannot be summarized, compounded, or you calculated, and you cannot have a meaningful uh, conclusions. So we did identify the faculty members who are like, so good in the research methodology, and then two, two members given to the some uh, synopsis. They gone to the word to word, line to line, and then they again improvise the synopsis completely. So that helped a lot in the last year for us now to improve them, the quality of synopsis, that exercise. Then we have each synopsis submission. Many people may think the submission of each synopsis is just uploading the synopsis copy, soft copy. No, it is not like that. It is totally it is a electronic based one where, for example, title. You type title in any form, any font, it will go to take fixed font, fixed type only. Likewise, headings come there, each heading, each one. So everyone is a pre-fitted that one, or drop down menus are there. So there is a appropriate way of doing that one, and there's no missing points also. And automatically it goes to the uh, guide, then guide to the research committee or PG coordinator. Likewise, whatever the, the flowchart will fix it up, the synopsis will go likewise only. There is no hard copy still submission till final uh, the finalization. It will move, move electronic copy, and then once it finalizes it, it comes there. And we also introduced the various certification systems. So what I observed is in the research, the people will take up research, then after the one year they come to the again head of the institution, sir, this parameter is not available, it is not suitable, I want to change the parameter, or this drug is not available, I want to model change my drug there, or this formulation can't be preferable, and we have to pay change the formulation. So this becomes a big headache in the institutions, where once it's approved, again going on modifying the, the protocol, so it's not so good. So then I thought of bringing certifications. So when the topic is the, the tentatively the, the finalized, the student has to go to the respective sub branches. 
Then they go to say, take certificates. Yes, this pharmacy can be prepared in the, my department. These drugs are non-controversial. All these are available by the drug department. These parameters are uh, can be available and are suitable by drug department. Likewise, we prepared a certification system. A student has to go to the respective department and then show the synopsis and get certificate by HOD and then upload to the synopsis submission part. Likewise, so this has minimized the corrections at the later part. So this system once adopted it, then almost there is no, is it maybe hardly one or two will be there. And otherwise, it has become almost more than 90 percent. There is no corrections come after synopsis this one. And then yearly themes. We have system of every year we adopt one theme for the institution. So one of the year we made translation research is the theme of the institution. So that every department take up translation research that one. So then we could able to bring out many, many formulations we have to bring out and able to take the license for the products also. So that way these are the steps which help a lot for in the institution to improvise our research. Next. Then come to scientific writing skills as which are the very, very important aspect of the total research there. And then here uh, what I want to say is simply attending more English programs will not help. So many times the other times they will they attend a program and increase their CV certificate list will be there. Otherwise, they really they don't acquire the skill. What is required is one is active involvement of general clubs. General clubs are very, very essential. We need to involve in general clubs more and more. Then you will be understand the style of writing, the style of the conclusions, the style of discussions. That are what parameters are there. So we have to have general clubs, very active general clubs are there. That helps a lot in improving scientific writing skills there. And then avoid publications in predatory journals. Many people are eager to publish. They give 2,000 rupees. Next day morning, they will be seen. And there are many people who claim that I have submitted international journals. I see in the WhatsApp also many renowned people, they submit it. When you see the date of submission, date of publication, then we'll be knowing how much thoroughly it has been uh, reviewed as. Those are the, the, the journals will claim we are uh, international peer-reviewed journals. But there are predatory journals out there. We should go for the very good scientific journals or standard journals we have to go for it. So what we did is, so we have workshops on each component of synopsis. So when we have workshops out there, for example, title. So we take it from old thesis, what titles are there. So we modify the title, we give the title, whether the title is correct or not, or on the base of title, they have to frame the objective, or give the objectives, then they have to frame the title, or on the base of title, they have to frame objective, on this objectives, they have to prepare the methodology. Likewise, vice versa, we have to prepare it. So this type of exercise will help a lot for the students to get familiarized with the scientific writing skills. Then we have to use the JAR, that is Journal Article Review. In weekly departmental PG seminar, we have introduced it. We have every Wednesday system is there, the PG general seminar. In that, we have introduced the general article review. So when we I saw the general article review departments, most of the times students or teachers go into the subject discussion. It is not subject discussion there. We need to know our subject will automatically comes there. But here we need to understand the art of writing. That is the most important there. Then what I did is I have identified two faculty who are very good in general article publications. Then I asked them, you make a presentation of how to uh, give the review. Then they made presentations of two seminars. Then student have uh, the inculcate the happy. Now our jars, the article reviews are excellent, actually say, say excellent. And uh, recently, when the JIM, on the name of the decennial uh, celebrations, second uh, event was our college, and then given the Ashok Vaidya, well appreciated of the student presentation, the, how the general article review was there. He, he amazed actually, he appreciated very well. That way, the general article review, uh, quality has been improved in, and this is very, very useful exercise. Every student, every department has to inculcate general article review in the proper way. And then making available of suitable index scientific journals. Then always we tell you publish in index journals. But how the students will get it? Then what we did is we made exercise and then each department identified list of journals, which are index journals, which are suitable for their departmental publication. And then the list is made available in the research laboratory. So any student want to publish article, they can go there and select a journal from the list. That way we made, we made a facilitation. And then not that we improve the any hello. And further we improve we improve the uh, publication skills. 
we made a 12 step publication presentation workshops the uh, 12 steps are there in that series of uh, workshops will be conducted for the students a small group of students identified they are given uh, schedule of the 12 workshops where one 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 time maybe they are identifying the content which to publish it second workshop maybe identifying a journal third workshop maybe they are reading the author guidelines likewise 12 series of workshops are identified so that has helped me a lot for us again to inculcate the scientific writing skills and then internal review system when a student submit a publication then we have internal review automatically good internal review and then we can approve that one and then we also have public incentives which will motivate again for the people to publish more and more these are the few of the activities which we inculcate in the institution which are given a good result Next slide. and then institutional research ecosystem this again a very very important aspect are there maybe your scholar is very good guide is very good good topic is there but institution should if we don't have the ecosystem then they can't be carried out so in these aspects research policies that are implemented easy to follow reviewed and amended time to time oriented to relevant people so these are the aspects you should have policy and the policy is implemented implemented and then easy to follow also it's very tedious that means you enter here you enter there you enter in the notebook also you go to take for letter permission letter from them like this you have very stringent system that is very difficult for the student to follow it but you have to make as easy as possible for the student to they conduct the research there and then we need to revise the time to time because uh, things will change topics may change specialty may change so we need to review the the implementation policy time to time and uh, amend accordingly that is most important then we have to orient the not only student even for example laboratory ipd the nursing staff the registration counter everybody must be oriented about the policies what they have to follow otherwise you may tell the only students but the nursing staff are not told they don't know what to be done in the research case comes there so we have to orient every relevant staff there and then facilities to be made available facilities rh facilities the rh committee should be there in the institution including ethical committees as case case may be human subjects or animals etc what are the cases are there we should have ethics committee also relevant and then we have to go for research audit also so the, at the end of the studies we need to go for research audit drug audit and then crf cells to be audited if we audit all these ones then we'll be knowing very clearly what the quality of the research so in our issue in their KLE, what we did is we established research policies the well document policies are there we have thoroughly discussed it and implemented that one and then we created we have pulled all the instruments to one area and made central research facility so that students can go to one area and can do all the research later on it become the ASU drug testing laboratory also we got Irish approval and it has multiple divisions maybe for example now the publication and documentation division patents division also there then the you know, analytical laboratory microbiology then animal house medical research center uh, AI tech division likewise we have multiple sections under the central facility where students can easily access to the all facilities at one group there and then we made mandatory for CTR registration and many people don't know what is CTRI in them, many PG students. But with a very long back, we made mandatory of CTR registration. Unless until they get CTR registration, the student is not allowed to register the case or recruit the subjects also. That we make it mandatory. That one. They have to give submission to the medical health center that they have registered. This is my registration number. Then only the hospital will give the letter to that one. You are under, uh, permitted to recruit the subjects. Then only they start recruiting. So that way we got a good control over the all activities also and medical health center should go, will go to the research audit in the drugs they have deposited the drugs to the medical health center and then we go to the audit actually how many patients are recruited what are the drug dispenser actually and then the all the crfs also we audit that one whether they filled it or any manipulations are there this also will go for the research audit because of the audit we got able to uh, good control and good genetic of the uh, research studies also these are the few of the activities taken at the institute level the financial resources ultimate this is the major uh, one play role unless we have money uh, whatever things are there money is not there we can't do it that way and then we have uh, financial allocations is very important there if you have sufficient allocations you can do very well research but most of the times we may not have that one. then we can go for the collaborations 
with the collaborations, we can sort out something else. Some part will be taken by collaborators, some will be taken by us. Then there will be money will be divided automatically. So we need to find out a suitable collaborators that way. Then we have clear guidelines, which part collaborators are going to eat, which part we are going to do that one. So unless and until the, uh, there is no clarity, the student will suffer a lot, or at the end of the study, the, that uh, institute may give a big bill, then there will be a big problem there. And then to consider uh, while planning itself, what is the budget? Sometimes the guide is very enthusiastic. You don't bother about student financial condition. They may give a big topic, but student is not knowing that time what is the one, because they are very preliminary that one. Then student will suffer a lot. So we should have financial allocations or financial implications at the beginning itself so that the student will be knowing how much he has to spend on what how much he is going to get the grant. And then sponsorships. We have to go for the sponsorships also. Or sometimes even to, for example, kids are there, even though globals you are doing, it will be costly. Then you can write to the company that one, so when the studies are being done, we want uh, discount rates for the kids, etc. The company will sponsor, sometimes free also to give. So we need to approach several methods for that one so that we can have, we be able to balance the expenditure and able to do the good research. Otherwise, without a good parameter, we are not able to do the, uh, the risk activities appropriately. So in the KLE, we have here marked the rich funds. So how much is there? Then established collaborations. We have more than 20 collaborations are there. And then indicate, we indicated the college, hospital, pharmacy. So that the pharmacy requirement it will be taken up by the college and will be sponsored by the pharmacy itself as an industry institute collaboration. Likewise, we establish the collaborations in between and be able to bring out many things. The students be able to bring out a product and the farmers be able to get the license for that one. Likewise, we be able to do the integral integration of the different units of the same institution and then be able to do the translation research in that area. Next. The research collaborations. So only having MOU is not sufficient. Many times, by the NAC purpose, etc., we may go for MOU. But they are another institution point of view. Ultimately, it's the department to utilize the MOU. When the specificity is there, how to use, when to use, the department has to have planned that one. So we need to have active MOU. That means whatever the MOU laid down, the facilities, that should be utilized by the faculty or the department. And then specification, where and when. So what is the their role, what is our role, when to collaborate, where to collaborate, how to collaborate, this all to be defined in the collaboration, or we can discuss and we can execute activities. And then interdepartmental, it should be interdepartmental or interdisciplinary. Suppose the science department want a medicine, or the new medicine, the, the maybe corona has come, new medicine they want. It can tell the, the, the medical people, we have the clinical paramedical study, the uh, safety studies, etc. all together, then give on to the as it's a clinical trial, likewise you should have an interdepartmental collaboration and the interdisciplinary also, a technology, etc. And then research guide must involve personally. When you have collaborations are there, a research guide has to go to the collaborator and discuss it and then identify the area, how to do it, and then tell the student to do it. As earlier I told, you should not play football with the students, you should have dialogue between them, both the collaborators. So having collaborations in KLE, we will be able to do a lot of uh, genetic studies, the cell line studies, stem cell research. Recently, we have done the stem cell research with the Enoba University, Mangalore. The instrumentation, I told we got the patents also now. Uh, now it is going to, it has uh, made into the sort of company, the engineering college collaboration, and is going to commercially launch the product now. The company is now is a established company now, startup company. We have developed software also. We have developed, uh, now we are working on the network pharmacology. And then we have yearly themes on the establishment of research collaborations. Because of the theme, that year we made more than 10 collaborations because the yearly theme was there. Likewise, we have collaboration and then inter talking to, together, we will be able to go for high-end research. Otherwise, it's not possible only with the Ayurvedic College. You should think in the uh, collaborative point of view. Next. So coming to the maybe end, end of the slides, research ethics. Ultimately, we have to follow ethics. Also. What are the do you do it? But ethical practice is very, very important there. So avoid bias and data manipulation. So there are many times it happens, the all the thesis will be there highly significant. If highly significant, again, the student who reported the highly significant, he himself will not use the same medicine. It indicates how much confident he is there. It indicates it is a manipulated data only. And all these are highly significant. Again, I agree, they stand still only. Why it happens that one? 
that means all these are manipulated data. So we should not manipulate the data. We should use the real data as it is. We avoid plagiarism. It's very important. Even like I can give my example. I have done my PhD and I have uh, I made the uh, alpharetus, the chilvetus graphical presentation. Somebody, somebody else uh, they, uh, copied that one without mentioning my name also. And somebody else taken that language has gone many areas. So we should not give the, the, the we should give the credit to the respective person. Even tomorrow, your own work may be copied by somebody else. So we should inculcate the habit of quoting the people's work as the, their work only. Then avoid complementary authorship. Is also wife is there in the same college, they will add the wife name as author. Or somebody else, HOD, as a default author. So any student is writing in the department, HOD become default author. So this should not happen. So we should have the contributory authorship. The so author should contribute something to the article. It is an intellectual property, intellectual outcome into there. We should not ask for the complimentary. Even HOD should avoid it. No, I never have worked with that one. Yeah, I don't want my name to be there. If a student maybe want to is a, a, a benefit from the HOD is there, I want to have his concern. But the HOD should avoid that one. Likewise, you should have the teacher must have the referred themselves only to a number of individuals, their names. Or the native cells. Appropriate ethical committees. We have to follow this ethical guidance, what the committee has begun, and then form of vigilance also. We should not be in the impression that no side effects are there. We should observe it and then report it by the analysis. That is the most important thing. So in KLE, we made a mandatory plagiarism check. When the PG study completed, they prepare the thesis, they should submit for the plagiarism check, and then they give the certificate. It is free from plagiarism, then only they are allowed to submit the thesis. So because of that, we could able to minimize the plagiarism in the constitution. Then I made an ECRF to, uh, to avoid data manipulation. What we did is the student, as and when he collects the data, he has entered to ECRF. So ECRF is non-modifiable. Once they enter the data, he cannot modify the data. So we have locked the systems. So the student have only entry facility. He cannot modify the data. Because of this one, Manipulation of data at the end is totally avoided that one. You will be able to achieve that one. The specification of each author role. So when they submit the publication, they have to write which author name and what the role, what they uh, played role in them in their particular article or manuscript. So that way they have to specify. So because of that one, again, unnecessary complementary authorship has minimized there. And then we also have peripheral pharmacological cell, which will uh, again act actively involving collecting the ADRs, analyzing them, which are the real one, which are uh, not uh, relevant to the drug, etc. These are very active phases going on. And all because since this is because of the activity that we have. And these are the few of the aspects. Next slide. So at the end, I, what I want to give message is a strong determination and then uh, overcome any sort of obstacles. You see. Uh, when you have strong determination, you can overcome any sort of obstacles. So the, uh, we can overcome it. Is a, I have the um, PhD studies. I can uh, a lot of problems I faced it, but because determination, I was able to overcome and I was able to get my PhD also. And working in constraints makes you confident. So you should invite the problems also. Working in constraints makes you confident. Then sincere efforts, helping hands extended. When you have sincere, you will get uh, the different helping hands to you. So we have to have all efforts. Don't bother about other help. It will come automatically. They start working with what you have, things will follow. So what is many times you have a small microscope, but you want a bigger microscope. You don't want to use that one. It won't have. So you have to start working with what you have. Then many things will follow it in their own way. Then open mind and helping, and you receive progress from all angles. So there are many people will never open up and we never talk to other people. We should have dialogue with different departments also. When your mind is open up and have, you are helping to others, and you receive focus from all the angles. These are the uh, messages at this point. Thank you all for the opportunity given to me. I once again thank the organizers for the opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sir's effort and hard work as principal of KLE's DMK Ayurveda Medical College has made this Ayurvedic college as research college. Sir is another name for research. He speaks research, he dreams research, he leaves research and he advises research too. He is the most innovative person ever I have seen, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening and inspiring keynote address. I wholeheartedly thank you on behalf of all three government college principals, staff and all students. 
I also thank our principal, Dr. Gajanan Hegde sir and Shevat sir for giving me an opportunity to introduce about you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. And myths which we have about research, which do not allow us to start work. Uh, I hope my screen is uh, getting visible. Uh, you can see my slides. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, the message which sir gave us was start working. And as I said, that the problem with starting is myths and misconceptions which we have about research and biostatistics. Yesterday, we have uh, heard about two speakers talking about statistics in Ayurveda. So I hope that some of the concepts have got clear, but still I will touch upon all the myths and misconceptions which are there in Ayurveda scholars about these two important things. Uh, first of all, I just want to make it clear like what is myth and what is uh, misconception. So when we talk about myth, myth is a, a story or traditional thing which is concerning the early history of a people or explaining the natural or social phenomenon. So myth is a social phenomenon. We as an Ayurvedic faculty or Ayurvedic fraternity, whatever misconceptions, whatever misbeliefs we have, they are called as myths. So as a fraternity, what we carry is myth. And what is misconception? That is a view or opinion that is incorrect because based on the faulty thinking or understanding. So you can see like this is a view or opinion and view or opinion can be of one person also. So misconceptions are basically related to one person, his own understanding, his own thinking that if there is something wrong in person's understanding, then we call it as a misconception. While myth is something which is prevalent in the fraternity itself. So we will see both myths and misconceptions related to research methodology and statistics. So the first first uh, thing, the first few myths about research. So first thing is like we all say like Ayurveda is Anadi and Ananta. So we do not need to do any research in that because it is Anadi and Ananta. What we will add, what we will con contribute to a thing which is Anadi and Ananta. This is a first myth and there are scholars who think that there is need of research in Ayurveda. Still in 2021, there are people who feel that all this exercise of research is futile. It is not needed for Ayurveda. And uh, there be an Ananta and who are we? We are so small people. What we will add to Ayurveda's great glory? Second uh, myth that Ayurveda is a complete science. Nobody is arguing, nobody is denying that Ayurveda is a complete science. But we all know that there are new food substances, new drugs, new diseases like COVID-19 has taught us so many things that which were not there earlier. So we have to learn certain new things. We have to adopt to changes. And that's why though the science is complete to adopt with the changes which are happening around us, we have to, you know, do certain things. We have to do research. The uh, next myth is research is not needed for Ayurveda because it is based on the first two myths that Ayurveda is an Ayurveda, Ayurveda is complete science, so research is not needed. But we have to understand to remove obsolete concepts like Arishta Lakshanas. Now, these Arishta Lakshanas have been described uh, years before Christ. So, I mean, so long, so back. And now the things are improved so much. We have now cell phones and we can contact any person over the world in a fraction of second. We can have teleconsultation, we can have WhatsApp calls, everything is available on the tip of our uh, fingers. So now the Dutta Lakshanas does not carry much importance. So we have to think like how, means maybe we have to develop something like how the voice sound, sounded on WhatsApp call or on uh, how the patient looked on uh, the video call. So these are the new Arishta Lakshanas, which we need to incorporate in the list of Arishta Lakshanas. So to have all these things, we have to do research. The second, mis uh, the second myth uh, is like Ayurveda is a holistic science. So we have uh, some sh Shodhana Chikitsa, we have Shaman Chikitsa, we have Panchakarma, we have diet, we have uh, some behavioral activities. We have even uh, yoga kind of things. So Ayurveda doesn't concentrate on one particular drug when it treats patients. And that's why the current research methodology that has been developed for modern medicine with reductionist approach is not suitable for Ayurveda research. So this is a myth which is prevailing. Of course, 
both these approaches are true like ayurveda is a holistic science and modern medicine is reductionist but there are different methods which are being developed the first method is whole system approach you might have heard about it or there are uh, studies like n is equal to 1 even uh, in a covid like situation the first paper which was published was only on one patient a case report was published and that was also very much um, important because that was the first case which was treated by ayurveda physician and um, this develops some evidence so everything is important and we should you know see these things another thing is like we say that research methodology of modern medicine is not proper or is not sufficient for ayurveda but first thing which i would like to ask you that to say this that research methodology is not appropriate uh, which our seniors are following since ages and then we say that research methodology is not appropriate this is not a true sentence of course the third thing which uh, we always see like uh, since i am in a field of research for 20 years i have chosen research as my career after i finished my md in 1998 and since then, I am working as a full-time researcher in the field of Ayurveda. I am doing only Ayurveda research. But still, I uh, I have no shame in telling this. Like, uh, when I joined this new institution, some people asked me, like, oh, you remember the shlokas also in Ayurveda? You are into research. How can you remember shlokas? So, the thing is, people feel that research in Ayurveda means translating Ayurveda in modern science language. And the one who is doing research, that means he is doing something against Ayurveda. Or he is, you know, taking all the things to modern medicine. Something, some sort of myth is there. But let me tell you that um, it is not like that. Nothing is like this. There are new study designs, new concepts, new ways. How you can prove Ayurveda on in its own language. And uh, you can just generate evidence. Now, I will ask you a few questions like, do we know that what is the uh, property distribution of the citizens or the of the individuals in Mysore city? We have like whole data. Have we categorized the individuals in uh, different property types? The answer will be no. You just remove the word Mysore and you keep any city, you will get the answers no. Do you know that what was the property distribution 20 years back and have it changed over a period of time? We have the answer no. Do we know that what is a property distribution in rural areas and urban, er, urban areas? No, we do not have. A simple thing which I will uh, ask you, like uh, I will tell you, not ask you, that I was developing a project on uh, obesity. And uh, since that is my working area, obesity and diabetes, so I was uh, developing a research project for submission to a government agency. And we had a meeting with some experts in the field and I was telling them with the uh, bottom of my heart like um, Ayurved does not talk about obesity in terms of BMI and waist hip ratio. Ayurved has different definitions. Ayurved talks about some subjective parameters. Then the uh, experts asked me a simple question. Do you have prevalence of prakruti as uh, sorry, obesity sthaulya, as defined by Ayurveda? Do you have any study that uh, whatever you are telling us as criteria of Thaulya in Ayurveda, do you have prevalence of that? Uh, have you? Do you have statistics of that? So uh, my answer was no. So you know, this, these are the examples of research where there is nothing about modern medicine. We are not even talked about any parameter. We have not talked about any high fat test. We have not talked about any genomic analysis. I'm just posing few very simple questions for which we do not have answers. And this is the research in Ayurveda. And every time research in Ayurveda does not mean translating it in a, a modern scientific language. Then the uh, next thing is research means working on animals or in test tubes. So uh, whatever clinical work we do, it is not actually research. Whatever we do is just a piece of work which we do for the sake of degree or for sake of something which, we'll, which we will soon see what, uh, what are the different aspects why people do research. But uh, research means working on animals and in test tubes is also not a true, true thing because even if you do work in test tubes, even if you do work in animals, the ultimate thing is you have to prove the research, uh, you, you have to prove the results in humans, in clinical studies. Let me tell you that in my 20 years of career, I have done in vitro experiments where I have worked in uh, cell on cell lines, in actually labs, I have worked on cell lines, I have worked on animals, 
my own embedding thesis was also involving animal study but after 20 years i have realized that although we work on test tubes although i have worked on animals the human studies are the perfect answers because even if you get results in test tubes you may not get results in animal studies of the same drug so final and ultimate proof is clinical study and we should not shy away uh, from carrying out uh, clinical studies then research in ayurveda so here what i want to tell you that um, we can have different uh, at different stages we can include or incorporate ayurveda principles like inclusion exclusion criteria you are going to listen to dr akash kimbavi after me who will talk to you about synopsis writing so in synopsis writing there is a point like inclusion and exclusion criteria which patients you will include in your study and which patients you will exclude from your study now generally the inclusion exclusion criteria is written in the way age of the patients and then the disease condition the severity everything based on the modern medicine criteria now tell me who has stopped us by including patients of only specific prakruti specific sar specific samhanan you can make your criteria specific to ayurveda you can always say that i will include only pitta prakruti patients or i will exclude pitta prakruti patients since i am working on balatak so this is how you can incorporate ayurveda principles at various stage even in assessment variables you don't have to have always the modern parameters suppose you are working on prameha of course blood sugar becomes an important variable but who has stopped you to have the effect on prabhuta and avila mutrata in case of adverse effects many a times ayurveda drugs work ayurveda therapies work in a different way sometimes some situations happen which is part of the samprapti vigatan for example a drug will work by uh, you know developing some loose motions in a patient now will you record that loose motions as adverse effect or is it a part of your ayurvedic samprapti vigatan or the drug action that you have to make clear and these things you can explain only on the basis of ayurveda concepts personalized treatments flexi dose black box design whole system research these all are new terms and i have talked to you about this that we can have these things to overcome the reductionist approach of modern medicine and if you do research using all these things it will be a completely ayurveda research just the thing which we have to do is start working and think about these things now i am coming to the misconceptions about research what we have seen so far was myths like as a fraternity what we carry now on a personal level what can be different misconceptions the first misconception is i am not interested in research now why people say so i don't understand because i feel that research is part of our daily life now a simple example if you have to purchase a mobile phone or a car everybody must have purchased these two things for their own purpose so if let us take example of mobile phone only if you want to do uh, if you want to purchase a mobile phone you know actually do a research you study the literature i mean the advertisements in newspapers you talk to your friends you ask the features which which phone is carrying most features which you want you uh, think about the cost of the phone you think about the radiations the phone uh, is uh, going to i mean you will get exposed after using those uh, that particular model so you know you take into consideration everything like you take advice of friends and you talk to friends so this is nothing but kind of literature review you what you do then you think about the features so efficacy how the phone will work how the phone will function that will depend on the features of the phone you talk about uh, i mean you discuss about the cost so cost effectivity also you want to know in beforehand that um, you don't want to go for higher phones you will prefer a phone uh, with a low cost and uh, more uh, features and you also think about the radiations you will get exposed to so you also think about adverse effects so simple a mobile purchase also involves all steps of research so we do research as in a day to day life so saying this that i am not interested in research is uh, not valid uh, submission then uh, there are some people who say that uh, i am doing research actually i am not interested but i am doing it only because i have to do it as a part of my mri so uh, this is a very common thing like uh, 
I I have to do it because it is a partial fulfillment of my MD degree. So I'm just doing it. I'm not at all interested. Let me complete it uh, um, as I can. But just remember that uh, sometimes your MD thesis becomes your identity throughout your life. I have finished my MD in 20, uh, 1998, almost 22, 23 years back. But the work which I have carried in 98. I, I'm still proud of that. Some uh, In my introduction, uh, it was mentioned that I worked on Snigdha and Ruksha Gunas. So that kind of work, which was pioneering. So I, I still feel proud about my thesis. I know some students who have done uh, their uh, research, every research, and then they carry, I mean, they, then they chose that as a, their profession. Uh, you might be knowing about Shreya's e-learning academy. This is not an advertisement platform. Please don't consider it in that way. But I just want to share examples that Shreya's e-learning academy is uh, conducting lectures on various topics um, since uh, the lockdown is imposed in our country last year. So the uh, owner of Shreya's e-learning academy, Dr. Mangesh Deshpande, he worked on Janu Sandhi in his MBA days. He worked with a orthopedician for his MD thesis. And now he has, you know, his own hospital, which is known as Orthoved. So he is practicing Ayurveda for orthopedics, uh, whatever diseases there in the orthopedics domain. So this is how his thesis, the MD thesis has become his life's uh, whole life mission now. Then another uh, submission is uh, when it is uh, faculty, they say like, I have to guide my students and that's why I'm doing it or I have to do it for my promotion. Unless I do some research work, I will not get promoted from assistant professor to associate professor. So I have to do research. Otherwise I am not interested. But my suggestion is like, if you have to do it, then do it with interest. Do it with enthusiasm and start taking interest in these things and you know, you will start liking research. Then uh, again, one more, uh, submission is one more argument is i have to do it as university asks us for it like rguhs has made it mandatory that every faculty has to do at least one research project that's why i'm doing it so all these uh, you know uh, views or opinions are based on false beliefs or false thinking then uh, there are few people that uh, first set of people we saw that they are not interested in research some people are interested in research, but they say like, um, okay, I have tried, but research is not my cup of tea. I cannot, uh, you know, do these things. I don't like uh, statistics. I don't like planning. So I cannot actually do it. And uh, sub, uh, our sub arguments for this is uh, research is a very complex subject. So, you know, I don't understand it much, though I like research. Research involves many terminologies. So this all what uh, John assessment variables, so many terminologies. I just hate these terminologies, uh, terminologies and I don't like this terminology. Actually, I would love to do research, but um, somebody should remove these terminologies and then I would be happy. So my uh, suggestion to you is, if we want to, you know, go to Rome and, and we, uh, th there is a famous proverb that if you want to, if you are in a Roman, behave like, if you are in Rome, behave like Roman. So if you want to do research, you have to get acquainted with these terminologies. And these terminologies are not that difficult that we will not understand. So make friends with these terminologies and uh, then you will not be afraid of research also. Why you are afraid of research? Because you are afraid of terminologies. There are people whom I have seen, they are worried about making the null hypothesis or proposing the null hypothesis. If I tell them, do you know Arthapatti Tantra Yukti? Null hypothesis is nothing but Arthapatti, use of application of Arthapatti Tantra Yukti, that you want to prove something, but you say exactly opposite of that. Then it becomes easier for them. But this is just a matter of understanding and looking at the things. So don't get afraid of the terminologies and then don't get afraid of research. The next thing is, I want to do research, but I do not have facilities. I want to do some genomic studies. I want to do some hi-fi animal study. I want to do this. I want to do that. But you know, like in, uh, I do not have those facilities. I, in our college, uh, so poor infrastructure, I cannot do anything or I do not have money, I need guidance. So for these first things, first two things, I do not have facilities, I do not have money. I think uh, Prasad sir has answered both these points in his lectures uh, very nicely and very clearly 
that you start working and facilities will follow. You have to just start and you have to look, look around you and the facilities will follow. Now, uh, let us take example of Mysore only. And I know that there is, um, there are pharmacy colleges in Mysore city. There is CFTRI like institute in uh, Mysore city. So, so many facilities are available there. You can always approach these people and get the things done for you in a collaboration way, in a collaborative way. Um, I will just give you example. Like recently, I have finished a project in which we have studied effect of uh, one basti on uh, gut microbiome, which is a buzzword nowadays in a obesity. So we have given obese individuals uh, basti, and we have studied the effect of that basti on gut microbiome. Now, to tell you that one uh, sample estimation for gut microbiome cost around eight thousand five hundred rupees, around eight thousand to ten thousand rupees. Let us uh, take a range. Now, before, after, and at least thirty patients, so you can understand sixty samples into ten thousand each. Then it comes to so much amount, six lakhs or more than that. Even I do not have gut microbiome facility at my institution. I do not have even this much money available to me. But then you talk to people. I talked with people who are working on gut microbiome in my own city, in Pune city. And they offered me this uh, analysis free of cost when I convinced them, when I talked to them and I told them how the project is important. They did it for free of cost. So the help can be available if you start talking, if you start exploring, and then money will also not remain a problem. I need guidance. The answer to this is today we are discussing on a platform which is an online platform. Now, nowadays, getting guidance is not a difficult task. Uh, as I have said in the beginning, the guidance is also available on the tips of fingers. Just you have to type a mail like uh, to any expert who, who to whom you will listen in this uh, symposium, in this webinar, and they will answer your questions. So guidance is also readily available. And the last and the best part is I am a clinician. I wish to opt for a clinical practice in future. So why should I do research? Perfect. You are a clinician and you don't want to do practice. Uh, you want to do practice only in your future career. And uh, you feel like you, you you will not need research anytime. Now, I'm sure that for one year, everybody is following the COVID-19 news and the statistics. And now you understand that how the practice has become. You should be updated about the things. You should be updated about the current research. How obesity and diabetes are making the life hell of COVID-19 patients. This, is, this information is coming from the research itself. And you are, even if you are not doing research, you have to understand the ongoing research and then you have to understand and apply it to your practice. Like suppose an obese patient comes to your clinic with COVID-19, then you will be uh, more precautious while treating the patient. So you have to, even if you will not do it, considering the research facts and the research terminologies has become now a part and parcel of our life. So we cannot, you know, uh, escape ourselves by saying this thing that I am a clinician and uh, last last uh, of research methodology that uh, whether the small piece of research I'm doing is going to make any difference to the huge canvas of science. Science is so huge and so many are doing research in the world. So whatever small thesis I'm working on on 30 patients in a small town, is it going to help in uh, uh, for science at all? So I will just say that every piece is important. Taj Mahal has not built in a night. So every piece of information is important. And ultimately, somewhere the information which you are generating, the data which, are, which you are generating is going to help uh, the uh, overall progress of Ayurveda science. And that's why whatever I am doing, I should do it with utmost integrity and I should do it with a lot of interest and enthusiasm because we should not think like how it will be helpful, whether it will be helpful. We have to go with an approach that it is going to be helpful somewhere to someone. And then you see your whole attitude and approach will differ. So this was about research methodology. Now let us come to statistics and uh, I'm sure Dr. Suha Shetty has touched upon some of these aspects yesterday. The first myth is statistics is complex, difficult. 
it does not un in only involve many terms like in research methodology there were only terms terminologies but here addition to that there are numbers also and um, again same like uh, research methodology statistical methods are not adequate or applicable for ayurveda we don't need any statistics ayurveda is anadi ananta that is our permanent statement so you know why why we should apply any statistical methods and let me tell you that if you read ayurvedic samhitas also carefully you will find that there are many statistic statistical terms though not in the terms or the names or in the you know they are not termed as the way they are termed in today's world but there are many references of statistical methods if you read the praman pariksha a small statement which chakrapani has made below that that kinchit nyunam kinchit adhikam is also acceptable means although four fingers is a pramana of forehead kinchit nyunam kinchit adhikam is allowed now what is this kinchit nyunam kinchit adhikam if we understand in today's uh, statistics terminology it is standard deviation like little standard deviation is acceptable but not a very huge standard deviation is acceptable so you know if you read samhita as you will find that there are mention there are references about the statistical terms also only thing is we have to understand now it in the current context or in current terminologies so the first myth we have considered like what is, what people think about statistics then the next uh, uh, myth is why statistics again i am a medical doctor vaidya so what i am going to do with these numbers and i always hated numbers i always loved biology and that's why i have chosen a profession which is basically a medical profession and i have always thought that now i have got rid of mathematics or statistics and why it is like a, you know the things coming back to me and uh, the statistics is bombarded on me so this is also an uh, approach of students and faculty by even considering statistics but again the same example of covid 19 it has taught us so many things so so many things like we always uh, look for the overall cases the mortality the you know recovery patterns how many actually individuals needed oxygen plasma therapy what is the effect of plasma therapy what we are talking about this is all statistics so as a medical doctor or vaidya also you are going to need you you are going to you know you cannot escape yourself you cannot you know say like uh, i i will just uh, not do statistics it is not like that and again i am saying and highlighting the same fact that although you will not do it in future you have to understand how the things are written suppose somebody writes that uh, it is uh, 10% more efficient or whatever in whatever way the statistics the results are expressed you need to understand those results and that's why statistics is important then uh, the third now we are coming to misconception about because the earlier two were in general in ayurveda fraternity these are now individualistic so i don't need to know or understand statistics why because i can pay and get then statistical analysis of my data from a statistician it is so simple that there are statisticians available i can just go to them and uh, get the statistical analysis then of the data which i will generate from my thesis perfect you will uh, get the help from statisticians and there are statisticians available who will do this for some payment there is no problem in getting done the statistics uh, statistical analysis from a uh, outside statistician but uh, you know this statistics is a subject which is a very actually it is a very uh, you know tricky and complex subject nobody is saying no to that but then bio statistician bio statisticians who understand biology and then look at the data is a very rare community and then ayurvedic means the statisticians who will understand ayurveda and do the analysis of your data is still a further rare community so you know ayurveda statistician is a very very rare community and that's why whatever you are talking to the statistician first of all he, sh he should be he should be able to understand whatever terms you are using that i had so many prakriti patients i had uh, so many sambhalan patients so first of all he should understand and after understanding he should 
be able to apply the statistical analysis properly on your data. And that's why my suggestion to you is at least, I mean, get, understand few basic things of statistics and then you approach statistician. You should be able to tell him that I want to get the analysis and I want this test to be applied on my data. Because my data, yesterday you all heard about this. So because my data is categorical type, so I want to do the chi-square analysis on this data. So please apply chi-square data. The person may tell you that Prakriti analysis or statistician may tell you that Prakriti it may it is a continuous data, but you as an Ayurveda person knows that Prakriti is not a continuous data, it is a categorical data. And that's why you should be able to understand the data types and you should be able to lead the statistician that I want to get this analysis on my data. At least this much you should be able to do. We are not going to become statistician after studying the subject statistics. But what we are going to achieve after, uh, I mean, going through the curriculum, going through or completing the synopsis syllabus of the statistics, we will be able to understand our own data and we will be able to take care of our own data. So uh, this thing you have to remember in your mind. Uh, then another thing is I can always express my results in terms of percentage, like after doing study. I can always say that so many patients cured, so many patients uh, moderately cured, so many patients uh, mildly cured, so many patients are uh, not cured at all. So this kind of percentage analysis I can do. It is very easy and I'm doing it since my childhood. Why to have so much of headache and learn the data types, the statistical test uh, types and why? I should just show it, uh, I, I can show it in terms of percentages. Uh, I give, I will give you one example. Suppose I tell you today that I treat cancer patients and then you ask me uh, and I say like, uh, I treat cancer patients and my cure rate is 40%. So you become very happy like, oh, madam is a great clinician. She is treating 40% of cancer patients. And then you ask me, madam, how many patients you have treated so far? And I answer that I have treated five patients and two of them have got cured. So five out of two. 40%. But if my answer would have been, I have treated 50 patients and I have cured 20 patients, your impression about me changes, though 20 out of 50 is also 40%. Okay, so understand the thing like FIU, 2 out of FIU is also 40%, 20 out of 50 is also 40%. And if I say that I have treated 500 patients so far of cancer and 200 of, uh, were cured, so that is also 40% cured rate. But then, in spite of having the same percentage rate or same percentage, whom you will consider, which situation you will consider as the better condition, better situation. The third one, because though the percentage is same, the magnitude defines like uh, how great the clinician is or how great the thing is. Now, we generally treat or we generally do study on 30 samples, 30 as our standard sample size. We do clinical studies in our colleges for our MD thesis on 30. And then we express it, the results in percentages. So of 30, say for example, uh, three are cured. So you will say 10% is my success rate. Is this correct? Is this the right way to uh, you know express the or understand the results of the drug? I don't think because it is such a small number that saying this 10% uh, is also not valid. Remember that the word percentages itself says that percent, cent is 100. So per 100, whenever you will have data of 100 observations minimum, then only you can present the data in percentages. Below that, if you have 60 patients, if you have 50 patients, the percentages is not a right measure to express your data. And I have also shown you the fallacy in uh, expressing the data in terms of percentages. So don't go for uh, these kind of percentages and please try to learn the statistical methods. So what has happened, you know, because of these myths and uh, misconceptions that people who are not actually from Ayurveda field are excelling uh, in Ayurveda research and they are doing research uh, which are, you know, far, far, far better and advanced than uh, all of us. This is just an example like Dr. Kristen Tara Peterson. She is PhD in Immunology and Microbiology. 
and on what she is working. So on, you can see here that developing herbal and microbial medicines consisting of pre probiotics and in combination therapies of probiotics, prebiotics, and Ayurvedic herbs. So uh, she being an immunologist and microbiologist is working on Ayurveda herbs and their effect on gut microbiome. And she is working on some other facets also of Ayurveda. So people outside, not only Ayurveda, outside India have learned Ayurveda and they are working on Ayurveda because we are happy with our myths and misconceptions. Let us take Prakruti research as an example. So very good papers which are published and uh, they all are very respected persons, no doubt. But what I mean to say that we always quote these references. Yes, Prakruti has been classified on basis of HLF gene polymorphisms or this whole genome expression study or genome-wide analysis correlates. And we become very happy. But who are these people? Though they are very respected and I have a lot of gratitude for them. Who are these people? These people are not from Ayurveda field. They all are from Ayur uh, outside Ayurveda field. And again, why? Because we are happy with our myths and misconceptions. So to come to end, what I will suggest, like even if you are uh, going to practice in future, even if you are not going to do anything about research in future, or if you are going to work as an academician after your MD, still you have to remember that uh, there is one term by the scientist and Ayush ministry has, uh, you know, announced this scheme and some uh, 14 research fellows have uh, come out of this particular scheme who are now known as by the scientist fellow. So what was the theme or what was the logic behind this thing that Vaidyas or the Ayurvedic doctors should excel in the current science also. And with this approach, the Vaidya scientist scheme was run by Ministry of Ayush. So here, the concept is a clinician who is doing research. So uh, even in your lab, uh, in, even in your clinic, even in your uh, OPD, you can do research, you can document the things, you can start publishing case reports, you can start publishing case series, and that itself is a research. Though very basic level of evidence, it is helpful for science. Then uh, you can do validation of research findings, and that is known as real-world data, and this is very new, new and important concept in modern medicine. Uh, for example, if uh, I'm doing a clinical study for my MD thesis, I will say that uh, I will take only patients in the age group 18 to 40 or 18 to 50, I will take uh, freshly diagnosed diabetic patients, I will, whatever, the whole list of inclusion criteria will be there. But when I will sit in my clinic, when I will sit in my OPD, can I say that, okay, my drug, I have tested only on these individuals, the uh, diabetic patients in the age group 18 to 40, they should have blood sugar range in this and this, then only I will treat the patient. Can you say like this? Of course not. You have to treat every patient who will be coming to your OPD. And that's why, in a way, you are validating the research findings in overall population. And this is known as real-world data because in real world, there are no inhibitions. Like I will have only these patients, I will have only this age group. These kind of inhibitions you cannot have. And that's why it is called as real-world data. And you can contribute to, the, to generating real-world data. And then ultimately, research cycle is something like you have to understand what is research cycle. So uh, I'm, a, I'm basically a researcher. I'm working in the lab. I have my own lab and I work on animals. I work on test tubes. I also work on clinical, I mean, clinical studies and so I do. But my basic focus, uh, are, at least till today, was animal work and uh, cell line studies. So whatever data we generate in animal studies or in clinic, uh, experimental in vitro studies, that needs to be tested. And that is called as from bench, from bench in the sense from laboratory, it should be tested bedside. And when you will test it bedside, when you will give it to your patients, you may might find something different that whatever indication or whatever uh, you know, uh, mechanism I have proposed, you may, may find while giving to your patients, you may find something different, some different observations, some different findings. And then that findings is also again to be confirmed in laboratory. So bench to bedside and bedside to bench. The researchers are giving some inputs to clinicians and clinicians again give back some inputs to researchers. 
and if this goes on then only research can happen research can continue so even if you want to do only clinic in future you can contribute in so many ways to the research field and to research in ayurveda and hence i will suggest you that don't carry any inhibition don't carry any myth and misconception about ayurvedic research and if you have any myth and misconception get it clarified in today's and tomorrow's deliberations from the well known research persons and i hope uh, you will excel in your field so all the best for your research studies and thank you thank you very much to the organizers also thank you ma'am now i request the students uh, for any doubts and questions now the panel is open for the doubts and questions i think everybody is still thinking about their myths and misconceptions yes ma'am oh uh, thank you ma'am thank you very much for an in, in, uh, informative and elaborative session and enlightening us with your presentation about the upcoming research challenges and myths and misconceptions in ayurveda and the measures to incorporate and measures to incorporate to overcome uh, those issues thank you ma'am thank you now we'll move on to our second session by dr akash kembavi sir sir will be dealing on the topic synopsis writing key issues now i request dr pat second year pg scholar department of ayurveda samhita siddhanta to give a brief introduction about akash sir a very good morning to all it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our research person for today's session dr akash kambavi he is currently working as a professor and director of pg studies at sgvvts sjg ayurvedic medical college and hospital kopal and also sir is working as a director and consultant surgeon at ashtang wellness hubli dr kambavi has been an excellent researcher in his area of specialization for several years He has acquired his MD from IPGP and RA Jamnagar, Gujarat. He holds post-graduation degree in Diploma in Medical Legal System and MS in Counseling and Psychotherapy from Kuwempu University, uh, Shimoga. Sir is a double gold medalist and university topper during undergraduation. He has published more than 10 scientific articles in various national and international journals. Dr. Akash is a recognized PG and PhD guide and examiner for research methodology and biostatistics in RGHS Bangalore. Dr. Kambavi is a visiting professor at Thames Valley University, London, and board member of Europe Ayurvedic Academy, France, and also a board member of a Journal of Natural and Ayurvedic Medicine of Medwin Publisher. He is an editorial board member of Rajas RUHS Bangalore, and invited as a research person at state, national, international seminar, conference, and workshop. Dr. Akash is a wealth expert and have a clinical experience of 20 years. Uh, with this brief introduction i welcome you sir and i request you to start the session over to you sir thank you sir thank you thank you uh, dr pat for the introduction uh, at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present my uh, talk today uh, i have been given to understand that there are pg scholars as well as uh, phd scholars uh, who are joining and uh, who are in the process or who will be submitting their uh, synopsis uh this is an area which needs a lot of uh, consideration a lot of deliberation and also i would say a lot of thought process has to go in in writing this synopsis in a better way because your synopsis becomes a protocol for what you are going to do so once you write your synopsis perfectly you know the, the, it is an art synopsis writing is an art which you have to develop so i will take you through some of the important issues so the topic given to me is synopsis writing key issues so i will touch upon the issues that you know why why we have to write a synopsis why research is needed why how to write the synopsis with example and what are the mistakes that we are doing in ayurvedic uh, synopsis writing 
So I hope that my uh, voice is clearly audible to all of you. If you can let me know so that I can start my presentation. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can you please let me know if it, this is visible to you? Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. So uh, this is what I will be talking on. Synopsis writing and uh, the key issues related to synopsis writing. Okay. So let me begin my uh, presentation. See, before we go into the details of uh, synopsis writing, etc., we have to understand what is happening in our surrounding, in the society, in the community that we are serving. Uh, all, of, all of you are aware of the COVID situation, how it came and then how it took us, the entire medical fraternity, by challenge. Okay, And if you are not aware of what is going on, then you know our, our contribution, Ayurveda as a science, today it is being questioned. A lot of people are questioning even today you know even though we have got a lot of publications a lot of debates a lot of vaidyas are treating uh, covid and its related uh, symptoms mild moderate or severe etc still you know it has not been accorded the official status of you know being like a treatment protocol we have our own protocols the ayush ministry has uh, published the protocols and most importantly you know we have to be aware as to what is the situation why these things are happening look at what happened with uh, coronel you know when coronel was uh, released long back in the first part then the people started demanding where is the data where is the evidence right and when the second time also it was realized that the evidence was not properly presented so people will doubt just two days back all of you must have read about the guduchi leading to liver failure or liver cirrhosis and the response to that has been that the guduchi which could have been used by that particular person may have been Tinospora crispa instead of Tinospora cordifolia. Now, please tell me, in all these years that you've been practicing and listening to your teachers, how many of you have ever heard of this Tinospora crispa variety causing complications? Or that has been the cause. It could be a, one of the causes of complications or liver cirrhosis or liver failure. All the while, we have been only taught about Tenospora cardifolia. Nowhere, you know, I don't even remember. I I learned that when I was doing my PG studies that there are many species where, where, where available. Some of them have got medicinal properties. Some of them do not have medicinal properties. But this aspect, you know, this is what I'm saying. This awareness is not there amongst our students, amongst our faculties, amongst the PG scholars, amongst the PhD scholars. So if you're not aware of what is happening with us, and if you are all restricted to our own areas of research or what we think is research, then I don't think Ayurveda will be accepted, you know, as a frontline medicine uh, system. See, what has changed now from 1990 to 2016? Okay. So you can, you can look at that. Communicable diseases, maternal, neonatal disease were more. But look at today. In 2016 and now, we are facing a huge burden of non-communicable diseases, which is 61%. Non-communicable diseases, which is a huge chunk. So this is where our focus should be. Right? Look at this cardiovascular diseases prevalence per one lakh population in India across the states. Okay, it is self explanatory. This is the status of the now. All these, if you just go into Google and the type disease, global disease burden India, you will find all these data. So, why are we not aware of these things? Why are we not keeping abreast of these things? Why, are, why is our research not focused on areas where we can make a difference? We think that we can make a difference. Look at these deaths, India. The numbers, stroke 1.5 million, cancer 0 0.95 million, cardiovascular disease, 72 million people in India die because of cardiovascular disease. 62.4 million people die because of diabetes in India. And 30 million people die in chronic respiratory diseases. Okay, so this is this is very disturbing, isn't it? Can we say that you know India is going to be number one or whatever it is? What are we becoming number one in? Is this is this the India? Is this the you know the the country that we want? Is this the health system that we want? No, I don't think so, right? So we have to be able to contribute. 
So what causes the most debt? See how it has changed. Ischemic heart disease still retains the number one from 2005 till 2016. COPD has come up, diarrheal diseases. Look at the right side of your uh, slide. Diabetes, 70% tuberculosis, lower respiratory tract, cerebrovascular disease, chronic kidney disease. See, chronic kidney disease was number 14 in 2005. Today, it has come to number nine. This was in 2016. So maybe today it is still gone above. 36.4 people, so a percentage of the population, percentage change, that is a percentage change. So this is again the same in a circular way. So, you know, why, what is the purpose of research in health science? If you understand this, you know, synopsis writing is just not sitting down and writing whatever we want, you know, that is not the case. There has to be a reason as to why you have to do a research, be it postgraduate or be it PhD. Right. So what is the purpose of research in health sciences? It is to establish the extent of occurrence of chance of health events. Now, Dr. Supriya was talking about, right, what is the incidence? What is the prevalence? How many of you know exactly? You know, if I ask you, if I ask you, can you define what is the definition of incidence and prevalence? What is the difference between incidence and prevalence? How many of you will be able to outrightly answer? Do we know? Do we know the incidence of, say, Vataja Grahani? Dr. Supriya talked about Prakriti. We don't even know the Prakriti in our own college. In, in whatever colleges you are studying, do you know how many students, how many teachers, how many patients attending the hospital belong to what kind of Prakriti? Are they having Vata Pradhana, Pitta Pradhana, Kapha Pradhana, or Vidosha, Tridosha, whatever the Prakriti is? How many of us know? How many of us know that whether we are today getting the Amavata as per Ayurvedic classical literature? We just follow the American Rheumatological Association criteria. There are five or six criteria as mentioned. Out of those three are present. And then we try to correlate. Pain is there. Swelling is there. Stiffness is there. Get a, RA, get a blood test done. They said that, okay, initially RA should be positive. Then they said, even if it is negative, zero negative rheumatoid arthritis. And then we went on uh, adjusting to that. Oh, Amavata, this is Amavata. Without even RA positive, we can still diagnose it as Amavata. We have never developed our own protocols. Simple fever, we don't know. How many people are suffering from Vata Jura, Pitta Jura, Kapha? Nobody, nobody. We, we don't even know. We don't do. Since 60 years, we are doing research in Ayurveda. 60 years, more than 60 years. The research organization started somewhere in 1950s. So we are in 2020. So it's nearly 70 years, seven decades. And we don't know these things. So what are we doing? It's very high time that we start asking these things, these questions. And if we don't change our mindset, if we still keep on doing the same way research is done all these years, I don't think we'll be contributing anything to the science of Ayurveda. So we have to understand the difference between chance and real. Undertaken on events occurring on an individual or group basis. This we have to understand. So you see, all these are studies which you have to think about, irrespective of whichever department. In That is the first mindset which has to go, clinical and non-clinical. I don't know who has brought in that difference, where where, where that creeped into our, uh, you know, this mindset. If I am from Shalya, I cannot do this. If you are from Shalakya, I cannot do that. Right? Some freedom has to be given to the students, right? If they are contributing to the science, allow them. And we, we need to do continuous studies. It's not that, you know, again, another mindset is, oh, this has been already done in the college, in your college. So you cannot do it. You cannot continue it. Why? Do you think modern modern science work? Like, look at what is happening with COVID. 2019, the first paper came out in China. 2021, we are still publishing papers. The same disease, one and a half years. Thousands of papers are published. It needs continuous research. Still, we are not understanding COVID-19. Still, we are talking of this variant, that variant. The symptoms are changing. And we think that by doing one PG or PhD research, in an Ayurvedic college with 20, 30, 40, 50 samples in PG and 100 in PhD, we think that that's the best research we are doing. And what is the difference between uh, PG and PhD today? Unfortunately, it's only in the sample size. 30 for PG, 100 for PhD. Why did this come in? What does it, What is the meaning of PG postgraduate and PhD? You are a doctor of philosophy. Right? So there are many things which we are doing wrong. We have to be aware of this. And if you the younger generation are not aware of the mistakes we are doing. And if you don't take responsibility of changing this, of demanding that we want to do this, you have to stand up for what you believe in. Then how will change occur? Change will not occur. So these are the areas that you have to think about. 
we have to develop diagnostic tools we don't do this we have never developed a diagnostic tool in ayurveda we are only bothered about the second therapeutic tool medical we, we only compare this person has taken that kashaya i will take this patha uh, this asava this varishta this guti vati bhrata only here there this and this we keep on changing that 70 years don't you think that all diseases all the headings in ayurveda we have been studied yes what we do now copy paste literature is already available dr prasad sir was pointing out right plagiarism checker if you if you subject the many of the dissertations which have been submitted to rghs they will not pass the plagiarism checker tool most of the dissertations submitted are copy paste right we have to be aware of this what are we doing investigative tools screening tools so where is the focus of research in ayurveda we are losing focus i would say you know we we never had a focus we just went on doing right whatever we wanted to do so what is the steps of research process is this this is a multi you know it's 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 there are a lot of steps in it so you have to select a topic to define the research problem write down the objective review of literature i will take you through all these things one by one but this is the general steps so if you can see there are nearly 12 steps so from selecting a topic to reporting it so the ultimate aim of research is to publish it okay so sample design data collection execution of project data analysis hypothesis testing all everything forms a part of your synopsis synopsis is a blueprint it's like your plan like a building plan you know elevation foundation everything so synopsis is the foundation for your research so it means that you should know exactly how what you are building what you are doing what you are getting into so every part has to be taken into consideration now look at this how many research designs are there okay we only do experimental design number 6 very few other studies we do action research case study causal design cross sectional design descriptive design exploratory design historical design longitudinal design observational design philosophical design sequential design i have given the reference so if you want you can you know, write it down and then you can follow it read it you have to be aware of these things only one one you know one track mind will not help research is not one track mind now how many of us know how many of you have heard about this the who long back it has recommended black box design for ayurveda the study of traditional medicine can also be undertaken in a black box manner this means that the treatment and all of its components are delivered as they would be in the usual clinical situation in this type of study no component of the treatment package is isolated it is not in isolation so what is this black box design it allows us to study the entire chikitsa sutra package no component of the treatment package you are not going to separate it you can study the entire chikitsa sutra this allows the effectiveness of traditional medicine to be determined either within its own theoretical framework or within that of conventional medicine how many of us know this how many of us are even aware of this why are these things not being promoted by the university by the faculties in colleges institutes we have to start talking to each other we are not doing that how many colleges are there in karnataka right do each college talk to the other college do you think every college has got its own you know uh, research wing or post graduate department there is no communication between two post graduate departments of two colleges let alone other colleges there is no collaboration i don't know what you are doing you don't know what i am doing i claim my study is better you claim your study is better when will we sit down and you know come to a conclusion if for example this year in many colleges across karnataka five or six people take a study on sandivata everybody's protocol will be different the way they write will be different the sample design that's fine but then there has to be some commonality we don't know we we can plan our own you know we keep on planning we are very averse to listening to others and talking to others we don't open up right that should not be the case research is not that research should have a very open mentality 
So what is missing? As Dr. Supriya pointed out, all these things are missing. These are th the first thing that we have to do. Demographic data only we don't have. We don't have parameters, population characteristics. That's what she said. Prakriti, dosha, te vayho ratri bhuktante madhyadika kramat. How many of us know this? We don't even know what is happening in our population. Health profile, environmental factors, right? Health levels. What is the health level of our population? We don't know. Epidemi from I am talking from Ayurvedic perspective. Epidemiological facts, no. Interpretation of tests, observation measurements, decisions on diagnosis. See, we don't know this. Decisions on diagnosis, publications, health workers. Why do we need this? Why is such research is needed? Why these things have to be developed? Because this will become a guide for medical care services. Today, you know, when COVID is there since one and a half years, is there a simple protocol which every Ayurvedic doctor knows that this is a standard protocol developed by clinical studies based on evidence in Ayurveda that we have to follow number one, number two, number three, number four, whatever it is. If that is the case, then why are not people following it? If you want to develop a guide for medical care services, we need data, we need research, tool for research, measure of health status of a community. It identifies the health. We don't know. In our own country, in our own city, in our own state, we do not know what are the health problems. We have the modern data, conventional medicine data we have. How many people are suffering from, uh, you know, uh, jaundice or hepatitis B? We have modern and prevalence, but not Ayurvedic. Helps scientific basis of recording, collection, etc. Right? Now coming to the point, you know, with this introduction, let us look at what is synopsis. This is how it is pronounced. Synapsis or synopsis. So it's a noun, which means a sketchy summary of the main points of argument or theory. This is a little meaning of that. So you see, there are two things, syntax and synopsis. So what is synopsis? A brief summary or outline of something that is put together by the reader or observer. So this is a simple, you know, from an English point, English literature point of view. Syntax means the way in which words are put together to form phrases, clauses, or sentences. Whereas a synopsis is a brief summary or outline of something that you write. Now, what is another word for synopsis? Report, recap, brief, compendium, capsule, epitome, abstract, review, condensation, outline, sketch. These are all the, you know, the synonyms. It's a table, it's a review, it's a brief. Brief means not short, brief means a summary. A general view as of any subject, a summary or abstract. It's a summary of what you're going to do. That is what synopsis is all about. And what is a research proposal? So synopsis in medical, in applied to medicine, applied to biomedical sciences is called as a research proposal. So a research proposal sets out the broad topic you would like to research, which is called as a substance. What research would set out to achieve? What is it that you want to achieve? Which is the aims and objectives? How you would go about researching it, which constitutes the methodology? How you would undertake it within the time available, which is the outline plan? And what results might be in relation to knowledge and understanding in the subject, which is the potential outcome? So your synopsis should fulfill these criteria. Substance, aims and objectives, methodology, outline plan, and potential outcomes. So what are the elements of a research proposal or a synopsis? So this is what it is. Title, abstract, table of content, and then section A, you can uh, further you know, classify it. Introduction, review of the related literature, methodology, ethical and legal consideration, time schedule, and then references. I'll take you through one by one again. So this is a scientific method. So first we develop a question. Okay, first we develop a question and we ask what is our area of interest. We develop a hypothesis. That hypothesis is tested. The data is analyzed and then we report the conclusions. So this is the entire life cycle of your synopsis. So where we are today here, we are here. We are up to the level of developing the hypothesis that is synopsis writing. But whatever you write, how you are going to do this hypothesis testing, is a part of the synopsis because whatever you write in the synopsis you are going to do from the second year onwards from the second year onwards so it is like a blueprint okay now this is called as a research onion model you can peel it in layers see how many kinds of theories are there techniques are there there are philosophical uh, approaches positivism realism interpretism pragmatism what are the approaches there is a deductive approach and the inductive approach what are the strategies you want to adopt? Whether you want to do an experiment, whether you want to do a survey, case study, 
action research grounded theory ethnography archival research what is the time horizon what are the choices mono method mixed method multi method what are the time horizons is it cross sectional is it longitudinal and what are the techniques and procedures data collection so you should know once you have listened to all the lectures in your webinar now you should be able to point out and tell okay what is my interest what is my strategy what is going to be my approach is it a deductive approach or a inductive approach what are what is going to be my strategy what kind of a study i want to do how much time i will need what are the data collection techniques that will come in statistics so this is what it is so you start with introduction research aims and question a review of literature study project and design timeline and expected outcomes and impact so all those 12 uh, broad outlines that i pointed out later can be clubbed under these uh, what you call these six headings now the why what is introduction this is where many of the students fail okay introduction means you have to write it very 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 crisply okay so you should be able to write it within 150 to 175 words in ayurvedic synopsis writing there is no uh, you know uh, guideline as to how many words should be there in each segment we don't care about words we just go on writing where do we start ayurveda is the ancient science of life ayurveda is a this science ayurveda is that science everybody knows so your introduction should be 150 to 175 words the why of research is called as introduction background information give background information what work if any already exists in the area what are its strengths and deficiencies this is something which we never do many synopsis miss this how would further work advance our knowledge of the wider area of study why do you think that your study that you are taking up is better than what has already been done we have to understand so write it we should know it if you want to know it then we have to read already what is existing this is where students go wrong they do not do enough research at all is an entirely new area of study being opened up so if you are some planning something new if it's a novel area why is this important if you are opening up a new area why do you think it is important and then numbering of references if any should start from here from introduction with example i will tell you then second is significance of the study after introduction this is also called as the need for study or need of the study see how many paragraphs should be there if there are many beneficiaries first paragraph why is it important to conduct the study second paragraph main beneficiary third paragraph secondary beneficiary fourth paragraph importance to researchers fifth paragraph importance to for future researchers are we taught how to write this right no college will sit down with you and they will conduct a workshop or something like that they will, they will guide you as to how it is to be written what do we do what do the students do pg scholars do they they, they take the previous synopsis of your seniors from your department and they just copy it nobody holds your hand this is something new that you are entering into you need somebody to guide you that guide also has to be trained in writing this not everyone can do this so if it is not available where you are away, where you are working then you have to reach out to people who can guide you but please don't publish wrong don't write wrong things okay very important now seven questions in writing significance of the study need of the study see here same thing why the problem being studies is very relevant what are its potential contribution how do the hypothesis and design relate to the problem does the study have theoretical implication does it relate to previous work are these testable theoretical propositions who will benefit and what benefit will they get from the study this is very important this last sentence is the most important one who will benefit and what benefit will they get from the study by doing your research what is the benefit that they will have i'll give a simple example okay if 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 you want to do a study on say uh, uh, a simple condition like night blindness now for night blindness vitamin a is a de deficient uh, you know vitamin what is the treatment supplementation of vitamin a tablets simple 10 paisa 50 paisa tablet you will get in that we want to try ayurveda we want to try say some gruta or saptamrut loha or something whatever saptamrut loha what is the cost of saptamrut loha who suffers from night blindness 
people from the poorer sections of the society why they suffer because they don't eat nutritious food so so that vitamin a which is in lot of store in the liver is depleted and they develop night blindness and which can something which can be treated by 10 paisa 20 paisa within 1 rupee we want to give saptamrita loha and we want to increase the cost or we want to say we want to give ghrita those people will not even get half cup of milk to drink and you are telling them drink ghee so who what is the benefit will they get do you think that the entire population will start drinking uh, trifla ghrita from tomorrow unless you make it affordable and economical is that research do you want to call that as research no it is not research right so your synopsis should answer these four questions please remember this i hope that all of you are taking down notes if you are not taking down notes then you are not a research scholar right i am very straight forward i am very open and i i know i i like to talk very very straight if you are not taking down notes then you are not a research scholar so your synopsis should answer these four questions pico p stands for population or patient i stands for intervention this is an example that has been given c stands for what is it compared with comparator o stands for outcome this is related to clinical trials pico so who is the population in this example is given in middle aged male amputee suffering phantom limb pain what is the intervention gabapentin what is it compared to with a placebo what is the outcome effective in decreasing pain symptoms so your synopsis title title should be the one which should be written the last introduction should be the one which should be written the last don't start with introduction start with other things then write introduction because introduction should consist of everything that you have done so far so pico remember this so again pico pico is a focused clinical question that consists of three or four of these concepts writing the pico question facilitates the search process and identification of best evidence patient problem or characteristics i stands for intervention c stands for comparison or intervention where applicable and o stands for outcome i'll take you through this again in detail see here again another example answerable clinical question if you are from say uh, kumar rutya or any other department among children with minor head injury does the use of ct scan versus other clinical findings affect identification and diagnosis of intracranial hemorrhage what is the type of question here you are trying to find out a diagnostic tool or diagnosis what is the type of study is it a, it's a controlled study systematic review meta analysis of controlled studies so previously published works may be there you can work on that and you can do a systematic review systematic reviews are not done in ayurveda because work itself is less we don't have good quality standard pubon dissertations we should accept it you know if we are wrong we should accept it and we have to change if you try to publish your article in a peer reviewed journal based on the work that has been done it will not be accepted why because we don't follow standard protocols example of a research question again another example see if you say women cell topic of interest women cell narrowed topic women and cancer women smokers and breast cancer so if your population is women age more than 35 one group comparator with no smoking will it cause breast cancer that is a kind of study you can do so in ayurveda what can you do okay let us let us take uh, smoking or let us let us not take let us let us only do a survey about let us do a research about uh, the ahara what is the kind of food that women are eating and what are they suffering from whether they are suffering from rasa dushti pakta dushti mamsa dushti medo dushti we can do anything or you can be very specific only take only one dushti whether the rajo dushti is there again in rajo dushti what rajo dushti what is the kind of ahara they are eating analyze it so such works are essential now we are not doing these works in ayurveda see this is a this is what my experience is unfortunately we do not have a standard reference synopsis template for clinical and non clinical departments i have tried to search but it is not available clinical and non clinical departments need to write synopsis in a different way they cannot write the same way because for clinical departments the protocols will be different 
the methodology will be different for non clinical departments the approach and the research design if the research design is different your synopsis pattern will be different we don't have this we do not have even a standard reference synopsis for either clinical or non clinical departments the university should have this reference synopsis from each department from shalya shalakya at least somebody can look into it and say okay this is standard and then we can follow it so there is a lot of work yet to be done i am not blaming everybody what i am saying is we have not given importance to these things they are not bothered about these things and then we expect that ayurveda is a scientific you know model and then all those kind of things and when people ask us questions we get you know offended how can you say that modern modern medical research method cannot be applied to ayurveda who said that dr supriya told you right myths and misconceptions it's 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 our misunderstanding that we have not been able to understand the concept and we believe that they cannot be applied to ayurveda that mindset has to change okay now example for ayurveda study i am taking you with an, giving you an example so that you will understand this is from a clinical point of view so pico so for example let us say population what is the population let us think that if somebody is from shalya or some whatever department you are you want to work on bph so let us say my population is men more than 50 because mutragata means there are 13 varieties of mutragata which mutragata are you going to take asthila some say pata asthila asthila is what asthila is stone like uh, growth in the benign prostatic hyperplasia is there a stony growth no stony growth is seen in ca prostate not in benign prostatic hyperplasia so the terminology also we are not comfortable we are we are not aware what we are writing best because everybody is writing mutragata in bph because aghata mutragata we are taking the literal meaning of the word mutragata there in bph but in bph there are irritative symptoms and then there are obstructive symptoms so be specific what you want to do so if that is the population then what could be the inter- intervention treatment you can take some shamana medicines you can take basti you can take uttar basti what you should compare it with available standard care what we do in one group we give dashamula kwatha in another group we give gokshura kwatha and see which is better mutrala now how do you decide that gokshura or dashamula is a standard care has it been proved what is the answer given some work some pg post graduate dissertation work has been done on gokshura they have that is it is submitted therefore we are taking it as standard now what is the meaning of standard please explain to me a standard work means something which has been accepted by everybody has been published okay and how many patients the uh, ayurvedic dissertation has worked on in gokshura or dashamula 15 patients so you you are claiming that a study which has been done on 15 patients is a standard work i am not arguing that it it cannot be standard but what i am saying is how do you decide that it is standard what are the parameters that they have followed has it been scrutinized just because it is accepted by the university does not mean that it is standard please i am i would like to clarify that no dissertation has ever been returned with queries or has not been ever been rejected by the rajiv gandhi university of health sciences okay i will share my own experience i have rejected more than 5 synopsis synopsis i have rejected i have submitted that they should be resubmitted with revisions similarly dissertations also should be scrutinized the pg scholar should know the guide should know what are the strengths of the work what are the weaknesses of the work what could have been improved we don't get any feedback as a guide i don't get a feedback as a pg scholar nobody gets a feedback from anybody what is the outcome what should be the outcome here quality of life improvement and improvement in ipsss what is that international prostate symptom score sheet so there are many measures so what i want to see in this case what is example men with more than 55 years of age so i can make two groups what are those two groups one group ayurveda second group available standard care whatever treatment they are giving let it be no problem that will be second group comparator okay i want to see whether there will be improvement in the symptom score sheet or there will be improvement in quality of life now what should be the title here what should be the title 
So as I told you, your site title should consist of all elements of PICO. Now, if I write this, the first one, is this a good title? Clinical evaluation of Uttar Basti in the management of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Do you think it's a good, good title? Right. What have we written here? Clinical evaluation of Uttar Basti in the management of benign. So do you think that with Gokchura or Dashamula, you are going to manage benign prostatic hyperplasia? Are you going to manage? For how long are you going to give then? Is it for one month, two months, three months, six months, one year? How long? Because your PG dissertation is a time bound study. So this is not a good title because there is no element of PICO at all. There is only Uttar Basti, which is treatment. And there is only one disease, which is mentioned. Nothing else is there. So if not, if so, according to you, if it is not, what are the reasons is it doesn't contain all the elements of PICO. So then what should be a good title? Probably it can be written like this an open labeled, randomized, comparative clinical trial on the role of Shamana Basti and standard treatment in urinary symptoms in patients suffering from BPH. This is how we have to write the title. So what does it contain? Who is the population patient suffering from BPH? You can be more specific. You can write in Koppal, in Hubli, in Bangalore, in Mysore. You can become more specific. What is the intervention? Shamana and standard treatment. What is the comparator? We are comparing to. What is the outcome in urinary symptoms? What is the design? Open label because you cannot blind. Open label, randomized comparative clinical trial. So we have to give a lot of, you know, stress on how we should write the title. We cannot just blindly write a title. So therefore, title should be the last one to be written. Don't bother with the title when you sit down to write the synopsis. If you ask any person who is writing a book, he will tell you the title is the last one that he will think of. First, he will come up with a plot, the story. Then he will, you know, he will play around with the title. Then he will select a good one. Similarly here, decide everything first. Then you, once you know what exactly you want to do, right? Next, what is the next thing? Introduction. What you have to write after the title? Introduction. So what you have to, have to do? Give incidence and prevalence of BPH. Statistics with references from textbooks and published articles. Very important. PubMed. How many of you have gone to PubMed? How many of you have registered on PubMed? Those of you who are attending. I will show you all everything. Here you will find all the published articles. Majority you will find here. Then what you have to do? Describe the disease, its symptoms, management in brief with references. Then write about what Ayurveda says about the disease with references. Explain the challenges in the standard care of BPH and the opportunity to evolve new strategies. This is what you have to write. This is the need of study, introduction and need of study. Explain the challenges in the standard care. So presently, whatever is being followed, this instead of BPH, it can be anything. If it is even a non-clinical, whatever is there available, whatever data you are planning to make, if it is not there, explain that. Then introduce your idea, treatment modality, and provide your argument as to why this would work. That is called as hypothesis. So treatment modality, whatever you are introducing with references and research evidences. Suppose you are you want to introduce Gokshura. Now you have to give their references of Gokshura acting as a mutrala or working on the urinary tract or working on benign prostatic hyperplasia. Do you think that your, your, your study will be the first study to be done on Gokshura? No. Thousands of studies have been done on Gokshura collect that and out of that which is relevant to you you have to provide not because bhav prakash has mentioned not because you know chakradatta is that is a reference but what is the logic is your logic that bhav prakash has described therefore i am doing this you can begin like that but then you have to go this is the rasa guna veera vipaka and these are the available research literature so this further substantiate our argument in developing the hypothesis that is how you have to write we don't do this. What do we write? There are many side effects in modern science. Therefore, this research we are doing. Is that, uh, <laughs> is that the correct way of writing it? No, right? Now, the next point in synopsis is review of previous work done. Please tell me what is the meaning of this. Review of previous works done. So my question to you is, do we really review the previous works? Have you seen? any of the previous works which have been published that you write or do we just list the previous works done? 
so the heading should be instead of review of previous work it should be the list of previous works done now what is the significance of this please tell me in what way does it help your work if you just list out that so many works have been done it is just a number now again it will matter only if the two studies are similar in designs this is important so you have to list out those works which are similar to what you are planning just listing them will not make any difference you know we have been doing this for decades blindly following without even thinking nobody even bothers to ask these things and where is this list available from dr bagel sir's book across india they are they have they have made all the list so we download from there we copy and paste what is the fun what is the need? what is what is the value of this is it just to point out that okay so many works have been done that is not your job that is already by uh, professor pels book and the, uh, the the current editors and whatever they are doing have you ever are you able to access that work have you read what that person has done have you studied his conclusion have you studied that person's you know design inclusion criteria so we know we don't know any of those things we don't know and we just say review it's not review then aims and objectives next is aims and objectives what is aim it's a broad goal that you want to achieve objective or objectives you can have only one objective or you can have multiple objectives so here a specific outcome expected always begins with two two please remember to study bps from ayurveda and modern aspect is not an objective it is expected that you should be doing this many students write this to study ayurveda this that particular disease xyz from ayurvedic literature journals websites they write this in objectives that is not an objective objective means your specific outcome to decide whether uttarvasti is better than standard care to decide whether uttarvasti or shamana will reduce the symptomatology in prostate symptom score sheet that is your objective studying a disease not studying a disease is understood that you are going to that is not an objective it it comes in the broader goal aim it is a part of your literature right then methodology the next thing is methodology most important is your research design what is your research design? is it a clinical trial is it observational study is it a survey study okay you have to know your research designs most important is sampling method how are you going to include the sam the people in your population and for that we need what we need inclusion and exclusion criteria i'll come to that next and sample topics is sample size calculation in rajiv gandhi university unfortunately 30 has decided a sample size arbitrary i don't know how that 30 number came and what do we do in 30 again we divide 15 in one group 15 in one why are we doing this is it even scientific in a phd it becomes 50 and 50 100 there is understanding that a phd means 100 100 uh, studies should be done 100 uh, sample size should be sample size calculation when you do that sample size should be for each group not the entire study in each group that must be the sample at least we should know how to calculate the sample size write it that sample size was calculated but because of paucity of time and available resources etc we are going to conduct this study on this number of sample how do you decide that it is based on the kind of patients you are going to get in your opd or ipd or whatever available if you are doing a survey study and if you say i am going to survey only 100 people why 100 people survey today with a google form i can complete in one hour one hour if you have got good communication network within one hour you will get your sample you know your uh, survey study done and you think that it's a good title for a synopsis or dissertation for a post graduate level that which is which can be completed in one hour why you want to take 100 increase it now they make it 500 make it 1000 make it 1500 can't you reach out today everything has gone online now you can do a lot of things so why restrict yourself groups ideally two for clinical studies many of our ayurvedic researchers have got single group studies no not acceptable please follow two intervention with details of doses should be written study duration should be written and follow up see please tell me if your objective is to just to find out by giving a seven day medicine let us say you are working on uh, sandhivata 
and what is your objective of the what is the hypothesis yogaraj gugulu reduces pain within 7 days so what is your comparator you can take decotrax sodium or anything else which is given in modern science or you can take calcium supplement whatever is given that can be your comparator what is your criteria of the research here the criteria of research is within 7 days will the patient get better that's all end of the study you are not bothered what happens to the patient on 8 day 9 day 10 day you can do that but then why do you need to write follow up in that case are you going to follow up the patient you can follow up that patient and then say okay then after that does it mean that you cannot give medicine you can you have to give medicine so within 7 days if we, if our research shows that 7 days is not a sufficient time to reduce pain when compared with diclofenac sodium what does it mean does it mean that our medicine is inferior is it a negative result no you can always conclude that okay maybe the dosage was different should have been different the number of times the medicine was given should have been different we should have given it for more number of days that's fine but at least we are preventing the complications or side effects or whatever it is of modern medicine so you have to understand study duration right in uh, one of the sessions that i was called to you know interact uh, with the de departments one of the uh, um, i think one of the topics that came about was uh, diabetic uh, retinopathy they wanted to do a study on diabetic retinopathy non progressive diabetic retinopathy so how will you decide the study duration do you think that giving one month is sufficient to for your study to become uh, scientific no the word itself is non dependent on it is dependent on your blood sugar control and what do the ophthalmologists advise they advise that every 6 months you have to come for a checkup so at least your study study duration should be 6 months anything less than that is not acceptable and therefore i have written in the last that it is always better to include a conventional medicine expert as a co guide be it clinical or non clinical this is something that we are totally averse in ayurvedic colleges i don't know why we have this uh, mentality majority there are few who do in in our, in our college in my department i always tell you should have a co guide you will be exposed to new kind of a thought process their thought process their thinking their opd their ipd their clinical experience you will be exposed you should get that in my dissertation work my topic was on bps that's why i given this you know to make it easier for explanation you know who were my co guides one was a ultra radio uh, radiologist and the other was a urologist i had two co guides from modern departments this i am talking of 1995 to 1998 at that time my guide professor kulwan singh sir he made it compulsory that you have to have them as co guide because you know what he said they are experts and you are a fool in front of them go to them and learn we don't do that we think that our department our opd is the greatest opd in the world we know everything and we don't even follow protocols i have seen many students i have been teaching 20 years now in post graduate departments clinical performer they don't develop they don't write down they don't document they don't take photographs nothing and now with the advent of mobile phones everything has become it writing is gone only photo screenshots photos and it remains in the memory that's all phone memory not our memory so please include a conventional person as a co guide argue debate with your guides in the department stand up you know research is your passion convince them that sir i want to work with this person you have to otherwise you know you will not learn otherwise those people how will they know what we are doing they will also support you they will say yes it is for us to reach out to them we have to reach out to them then inclusion exclusion criteria very important it's a very important step know your disease thoroughly very important know your disease thoroughly only then you can write the inclusion exclusion criteria who you have to include who you have to exclude again as dr supriya was pointing out okay there is lot of ayurvedic things that we don't write in the inclusion exclusion criteria they are mutually exclusive one example i'll give if you write inclusion criteria say males in B, in bph for example males right between the age of 55 to 70 will be included in exclusion what we write 
males below 55 and above 70 will be excluded there is no need to write, to write that it is understood right it is understood so we have to write even ayurvedic also only vata pradhana prakriti pitta pradhana see in many of the dissertations in all dissertations in ayurveda irrespective of whichever department you belong to right we collect data of what dashavida pariksha sara sattva sammanana ahara shakti you know vyayama shakti in every dissertation there is a table 10 patients belong to pravara then madhyama avara have we assessed have you done an assessment really or it is just a table nobody bothers even in shall department we we show those tables so i told my students this year don't show that table if there is a something important just highlight it if there are avara sattva you highlight that that's all they were not willing for surgery they were not willing for this etc why do you have to show all those details in 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 a disease which is not related to that if at all you want to relate it then make your study relatable just for the sake of presenting don't present it so the people who evaluate the dissertations and synopsis all these things they should also know this right assessments there are two kinds of assessment that you have to know subjective and objective assessments means what kind of data you will be collecting most of the ayurvedic symptoms fall into subjective criteria all the symptoms are subjective objective parameters are very very less in ayurveda if at all you want to use objective use standard internationally accepted scales so in this case of bph international prostate symptom score sheet quality of life health questionnaire they can be used they have which have been international like what do we do in ayurveda we we make the our own grades symptoms we start grading absent mild moderate severe we don't even define what is mild moderate severe and we give them grades 0 1 2 3 and by just giving grades 0 1 2 3 we think that we are making it objective no that is wrong so when it comes to assessment you should know what are the kinds of data in data there are two data types one is called as qualitative data the other is called as quantitative data qualitative means subjective where you are going to qualify how are you feeling today right how are you feeling today it is subjective you can say good bad worse how was the lecture that you attended by dr akash boring good excellent absolutely useless you can grade me anything any way you want but if i give you options only best better excellent so it is up to me right if i give options saying that my lecture was best good excellent only three options i have given you no other options so you have to give so what will be the outcome my if i give that feedback to the organizers then i will say that oh dr kembao's lecture was good because there is no option to give poor average useless not useful even though you feel that you may have felt it but i have not given any option to write it so how will that become good research so these are the mistakes we do i hope you are understanding what i'm trying to tell you right so please know your data types qualitative subjective quantitative so so quantitative means anything that is measured with a instrument all blood values they are all quantitative height weight blood pressure everything is quantitative okay scales are there for for example in uh, what you call uh, the uh, pain how do you grade pain many many a times uh, we have seen many dissertations or synopsis where they say zero is absent mild moderate severe what is mild pain what is moderate pain what is severe pain that is not the criteria so there are some uh, scales available which are called as visual which is called as visual analog scale that is one of the scales visual analog scale so there it is a grading from 0 to 10 so you ask the patient from a scale of 0 to 10 how severe is your pain let them point out before treatment let them point out after treatment so you get a number now you know how much severity is there but if you write only mild moderate severe tell now hang there how is your headache very severe sir how do you know it is severe so why this is important because this will be the basis of selecting your appropriate statistical test in in ayurveda unfortunately we believe that t test is the standard test no t test is one of the tests there are many other tests and for many ayurvedic dissertations the t test has got very limited applications only when it is objective you are taking parameters for everything else 
you have to go for non parametric tests i'm sure that somebody else will cover in that but you should know this then referencing style for our synopsis is vancouver so what you can do i have written down here mendeley okay go to this download this tool there is an app also and on web also it's available go to mendeley learn go to youtube and find there is a 10 minute or 20 minute video on how to use mendeley do this you have to do this otherwise you know you will not learn if i tell you everything go to mendeley download mendeley this is a reference management tool it will create references in any style that you want okay use this then look at this how many of us are aware of this let me just see if this loads up right ccrs research policy approved i'm just loading it up hope it will load yeah can you see this can somebody tell me if you can see this are you able to see this hello yes sir are you able to see this yes sir okay it's visible see, this is yeah ccrs research policy now here i will just directly scroll down please download this document see here this is for clinical research for clinical research there are prioritized disease conditions and areas go through this select your diseases from this list preventive cardiology atherosclerosis hypertension dyslipidemia gastrointestinal musculoskeletal eye diseases they have listed now what is the use of this because they have got grants you can apply for a grant if it falls within that category you can apply for a grant and they will give you money it's not only in clinical research it's a big document of 36 pages all departments are fundamental research so it begins with fundamental research see mode of project development see here priority areas fundamental research see how they have listed here to assess quantify panchamahabhuta tridosha agni dhatu ojas srotas ama gurvadi guna chhat kriya kala prakriti that is what we need to be doing the, the the document is there how many of us are aware how many of the faculties are aware how many of the guides are aware what are the first areas in each department this should be the bible this should be like in it should be there literature research drug research each department they have see how many areas of research they have given including veterinary ayurveda products we don't do any of these things then clinical research right then methodology approach everything they have written here please go through this you know uh, reference okay so this is the ccrs research policy next then go through this how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 i have given here every research scholar should have this in your bookmark compulsory okay you should have now let me try to load this what is this ctri clinical trial registry of india go to that website see what our previous works have been done just day for yesterday three days back the ministry of ayush released the five portals how many of you have gone through those portals pubmed see what is pubmed i will show you how many articles are there 7 million articles 2484 journals so what is pubmed let me just load this see this is pubmed pmc stands for pubmed central okay go through this website see here 7 million 7.1 million articles are archived 2484 full participation journals 332 nih portfolio journals and 7998 selective deposit journals huge collection this is where you need to do the search of your research works here this block here is a search so if you type in you will get all the articles so that is pubmed then go to scopus what is scopus scopus preview okay so you have to register for this looking for free journal rankings check out your free author profile please go through these things 
it's maintained by Elsevier. Okay. Very important. You have to know these things. Visit these websites. Then there is something called as Web of Science. See here, what is Web of Science? Confident research begins here. The Web of Science is the world's most trusted publisher independent global citation database. Global citation database. You should know exactly what do they mean. See here, our multidisciplinary platform connects the regional speciality data and patent indexes to the Web of Science core collection. See here, how many articles? from almost 1.9 billion cited references from over 171 million records. Huge. We are not doing anything in Ayurvedic field. We have to start doing these things. The younger generation should know this. Then there is something called as Dhara. What is this Dhara? Digital Helpline for Ayurvedic Research Articles. D-H-A-R-A, -A, Dhara. So what it is? Dhara is an online index of articles on Ayurveda published in research journals worldwide. How many articles are there? 9,048 articles are there. Okay. You have to know these things. Go through these things. You have to start your work here in this area. Then most important is this equator network. What does equator mean? Enhancing the quality and transparency of health research. EQU8E is enhancing quality transparency of health research. What is this equator research? I will show you. See, this is equator research. Why? What is this research? Because there are reporting guidelines for main study types. For randomized trial, consort guidelines. Observational studies, strobe. 471 reporting guidelines are there. 471. So we'll first decide what is the kind of study you want to do. Then go through this. Then plan your synopsis. Okay? Very important. And lastly, Register yourself as an author because you are going to publish articles. So this is called as ORCID. And this is my author profile and author number. My ORCID number ID is, it's a 16 digit number. It is given to you. Right? So we had extensive training, extensive uh, you know, lectures. In and out, we could discuss. That gave us, without knowing, you know, now we have entered. Within three, four months, they want you to write a synopsis. How is it going to be possible? And it's a fact. Many guides do not have a good hold on these concepts. I'm sorry if I sound too you know, bold or whatever, but this is, has been my experience. Many guides themselves do not have a good hold of these concepts. And the criteria of becoming a guide should change. These are changes in a policy matter, but I thought that this should be that. Now, what, why I'm telling you this is, as a research scholar, you have to stand up for what you believe in. Many students will tell, so guides want this, the department want that, therefore I'm doing this. That is not research. Then where is your individuality? Where is your passion for Ayurveda? Where is your passion to work something for the science? That should show up. Don't argue. I'm not saying get into argument. Discussion is important. Therefore, we need to have forums where we can discuss these things. The university, the collaborative, you know, there should be a platform where you can, you know, you can uh, uh, submit your, your protocol, your idea to a common platform where all teachers from different colleges are there, they will be able to give inputs. Institutional ethical committee in many colleges is just a joke. Nobody follows those protocols properly in majority of colleges. It is just on paper, with they just sign and give it to you, IEC, that is ethical clearance has been given without asking any questions. How is that research then? How is that scientific? Let us, you know, whatever has happened has happened. Let us forget that. I'm not blaming. I'm just paint. I'm just giving you the reality. It is time that we have to change. The change has to come from the students. You PG scholars and MD and PhD people should start demanding change. We should be held accountable. Our teachers, we, including me, we should be held accountable. There should be transparency. 
then our research improves. Continuous works have to be given in the same department for two, three years, four years, five years, same subject. Let them continue. In our mindset, we have no, 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 it will be rejected in the university. Why? Why can't you go and defend it? Why can't we change? We have a board of studies, right? We have a separate faculty. Why can't teachers, why can't we, you know, go and convince them? There is no meetings called, unfortunately. I'm sorry, you know, I don't know whether I should talk about these things, but I'm giving you the reality. You have to start demanding. How many of you have written? We don't write only. I have written they were, you know, letters to the VC, to other people. You should start writing. And how will you write? Only when you are aware of these things. So please demand that you be taught proper research, that you be trained in research. Very important. Okay. So this was my presentation. I wanted to talk what are the key issues, how to write the synopsis, what you have to think about, etc. So I would like to conclude my presentation here. If you have got any questions. Thank you, sir. Please uh, let me know so that I can. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, for, sir, any now questions? we have two uh, questions in the, in the chat box. Yes, sir. First question okay. is referencing for everything quoted in synopsis or thesis is mandatory. One second. Let me just open it. Okay. Referencing for everything. Yes, it is mandatory. Yes. Referencing means you are giving credit to the person from whom you have referred. You cannot claim it as your work. If you have, Even if you have taken one single word, one single phrase, one single sentence or a paragraph, you have to give reference. It is mandatory. You cannot argue about it. No, no, no. It doesn't mean oh, there is no new scope for research. No, 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 no. That, no, you, I think you have misunderstood it. We will be repeating what is said in Shastra. No. That is why I told you, you know, this is this is a very good question. In fact, it brings to light the very important area. In many of our dissertations, we end up writing sections like Ayurvedic review, literature, and modern review of literature. That is where reputation will be there. That is not what is expected from a PG scholar. A PG scholar should be able to write, or a PhD scholar should write what he feels he has learned in that particular area of research. That is a literature review. That is what is expected. You See, in, in many of the dissertations, our Ayurvedic references, where do they start from? They start from Veda, thousands of years back, from Vedic literature, from um, uh, Samhita literature, medieval literature, recent literature. Every dissertation, you open up, for example, if if you uh, if you see uh, any dissertation on Pandu, same references will be there. Why? Why you have to write? Is there any limitation number of words used while writing the title? Yeah, it's a good question. Again, it should not be too lengthy a title, but again, as long as you are covering the PICO, you can cover, you can write it. At least it should be minimum 8 to 15 words. That is one thing. Which was that application used for referencing Mendeley. M-E-N-D-E-L-Y. And maybe I'll type it so that you can see. Please go and download this. And on YouTube, there are beautiful uh, videos on how to use Mendeley. Use it. It, it makes your life very easy and you can store those references, right? You can store those references because tomorrow when you're submitting articles to some uh, journals, each journal have their own referencing styles, which they expect. So you cannot keep on doing it manually. Mendeley will do that automatically for you. You can have it as a resource. Taking standard for is compulsory. Yes, I believe it is, it is compulsory. Mutre Abhidhavanti Tipilika, qualitative, it's not quantitative. How can you quantify it? Are you going to count the number of ants? The answer will be yes or no, right? The answer will be yes or no. So it cannot be quantified. Uh, what is action research? Again, I, uh, this is a big topic. Maybe some other day if you call me, I can talk only on research designs. It's too, uh, too, too short a time to explain these things. Is there any standard guidelines for development? Yes, we visit Equator guideline. There are all these guidelines which are given. You read that and see if you, those can be applied to Ayurveda. If not, then we have to start developing our own guidelines. Absolutely. We have to start doing that, that this is the time. But there are reference models available. If it's observatories, observational kind of study, for diagnostic study, that is called a STARD. 
uh, sorry, strobe. Strobe is for observation, then star is for research and diagnostic studies. So all the guidelines are there. You just go through the checklist. Each guideline has got checklists. From minimum 20 to 30 to 40, checklists are there. I mean, items are there. So you can go into that. Why is there need of two groups in clinical trials? Very good question. If you are comparing two things, only then you can say which is better. If you do a single group study, then which how do you how do you say that that is better? Right? See, it, it, let me give a simple example. If somebody wins a gold medal in Olympic, a gold medal has value only when there is silver and bronze medal. You compare that, right? There is no single gold medal there. There has to be a winner and there has to be a runner. So that is comparison. That's why you need a comparator. If you say somebody is intelligent in a class, intelligence compared to what? Compared to whom? Do we get grants for dissertation work? Yes, you can get grants. It may not be released immediately, but if you follow the protocol, write it correctly, research grant writing itself is an art, develop it correctly, you know, you submit it, maybe you will, you, you will get, definitely you'll get. But remember, there are many people who are applying. So your work has to be standard, has to be scientific, and you have to follow it up. Definitely you will get the grant. If research proposal, both literary and applied aspect, then what factors? Both have to both have to be written. No problem. Both have to be written. So decide upon the title at the end. That's what it will do. Decide what is your research design. You can do both. No problem. Say, for example, in Dravaguna Rasa Shastra, people take experimental study and clinical study. So they have to mention both. They have to mention both. So don't bother about the length of the title. Write it first. It can be four sentences. Then see how you can crop it, how you can reduce it. That will happen. Don't worry. You share it with others, you know, other teachers. Get their feedback. Very important. Okay. Yeah, I can see uh, Dr. Madhav. Yeah. Namaste, uh, Madhav, Dr. Madhav. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking a little bit of your time. Please excuse me if I have uh, encroached on your time frame. Right. Okay. Uh, Thank so you, sir. Are, uh, no more questions. I think we can end the session, moderator. Yes. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving such a detailed informative session about the considerations mm -hmm. for synopsis writing and identifying us about the key issues. It's the need of our, now it's the turn of our first year PG scholars to incorporate all these elements and considering the issues while writing the synopsis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we'll move on to our today's last session by Madhya Digavi, sir. And sir will be dealing with the topic on clinical research. Now I request Dr. Rahul, second year PG scholar, Department of Kaya Chikitsa, to give a brief introduction about Madhya Digavi, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope I am audible. Um, I consider this as my privilege to introduce Professor Dr. Madhav Diggavisam, son of uh, D. Brenugopal Acharya and late Srimadhi D. Rukmani Devi, who completed BMS degree from Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya Hubli in 1994 with five consecutive ranks. Sir completed his post graduation from IPGT and RA National Institute, Jamnagar, in 1998. Sir is currently serving in Taranath Government Ayurveda College and Hospital, Bellary as professor and HOD of Department of Kaya Chikitsa and is a coordinator for PG studies in the same institution. Sir has a teaching experience of over 22 years and over the last 20 years, he has treated more than 90,000 cases with pure Ayurveda. Expertised in Kaya Chikitsa, Panchakarma, Desayana, Vajigarna, Manasaroga and thyroid and spine disorders. Sir has presented three international papers, 10 national papers and 30 eight papers and with 10 publications, five radio talks and uh, five TV programs and has guest lectured in over 150 occasions. Sir has chaired four conferences and gave keynote address in five conferences. Sir has recently completed state research project on management of anemia with Datri Loha. Sir is a consultant at Bangalore Panjarama Center and Vatsala Healthcare Center in Bellari. 
and is currently working under Vaidya Srikant Bhagavadekar on cancer and multi-organ failure. Sir, what's a former member in CCM Syllabus Committee and peer reviewed in IU International, International Journal, examiner for RGHS Bangalore and JAU uh, Jamnagar and Amrita School of Ayurveda Kolla. I wholeheartedly welcome Professor Dr. Madhav Digavit sir uh, to Nyaneshna 2021. Welcome sir. Thanks. So, shall I start? Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, sir. Now the Ragadi Rogan, Satatan, Shatan, Aseja Kaya, Prasatan, Aseja, Otsuke Moha, Ratidan Jagana, Yopurva Vaidya, Namusta Tasmo. With great salutations to Acharya Charaka Sushata Vakbata, Pandit Taranath. At an outstretch, I am thankful to our Honorable Commissioner, Department of Irish, Joint Director. I am thankful to all three principals of Government Ayurveda Colleges of uh, Karnataka. And I am also thankful to the organizers who have given me an opportunity. I will discuss few things with all my first, uh, PG, first year PG scholars. So my talk will be divided into two aspects. One for your first year PG examination, either theory or viva was. At least 20 marks will be minimum covered by clinical research in the question paper. You should be able to answer. In that way, I have prepared slides for today. Another issue is my students and friends who are attending today should also have some insight in making some research, learning research. Today it is a golden day that three consecutive classmates are presenting in today's webinar, Dr. Supriya, Dr. Akash and myself. All three were PG classmates. The previous talk, uh, speaker, I will focus on some areas of uh, clinical research. It is a branch of medical science that determines the safety and effectiveness of medication, devices, diagnostic products, and treatment. The clinical research is for prevention, treatment, diagnosis, or increasing the quality of life in disease. Currently, the global standards are working on quality of life in research. The clinical research provides insight to the diagnosis, cause, care, and cure of the disease. The aim of clinical research is very clear. We will ask in Viva was, what is the aim of clinical research? Number one, it is scientific validity. Second is reproducibility of the results. We call it as a clinical research process. It is commonly asked for short notes in exam. And every research scholar must understand these steps and then start a synopsis writing or clinical research. You should have a proper study design. You should have study population. There is a formula for calculating sample size and sampling. Study subjects. Who are your study subjects? Tool of data collection, data management and statistical analysis. You properly understand what statistical methods you will apply to your study, duration of the whole project, follow-up and safety considerations. All these things will make you to start a clinical research. Study design, it is observational or interventional research. You first, you declare whether you are doing a descriptive research or analytical research, you do that whether you are doing some cross-sectional studies or longitudinal studies. Actually, for Ayurveda, these longitudinal study type of uh, clinical research is more effective. Cohort studies or case control studies are also a very good platform for uh, doing a research. The controlled and non-controlled studies are there. Better you develop on controlled studies. A plasma control nowadays should be standard control or the control. A contemporary control study. 
you decide whether you are doing a preclinical study or a clinical study and then start your clinical research. So we have on the basis of what is our purpose? The purpose is to be clear before you start a research. In clinical trial, we have some five, six uh, purposes. One is prevention trials. You want to prevent COVID-19, this is called prevention trials. Preventive rasayanas are there. Anagata bada pratishedam of Acharya Sushruta is a prevention trial. So we have prevention trials in Acharya Sushruta's expertise. Rasayana Chikitsa has got prevention, curative and prophylaxis type of purpose. So Ayurveda has got this clinical trial basis in some methods. Screening trials, some treatment trials, sometimes quality life improving trials. These last type of quality of life improving trials is very important aspect nowadays where uh, uh, the research is going on. Every student of research must clearly understand observational study and interventional study. Observational study is researcher do not have control over the variables. It is observation. Rather, he can observe and report what is happening. He is a just observer. He observes and reports. Investigator does nothing to affect the outcome. If you are nothing doing to make some outcome, but you are only observing and documenting, then it is called observational study. Cohort and case control studies are examples for these studies. Observational study is also a good study. I, I, I work on this observation. Where our PG scholars are going to observe the modern research going on, modern clinical treatment going on, they will document as it is as one group of study. In cancer, we usually make this where one allopathy group of uh, observations are made and it is documented. Another is our interventional Ayurvedic study. Then you can combine or you can compare whether the modern ongoing treatment is effective or Ayurvedic intervention is effective. You can tell the comparative improvement. Interventional research is the researcher makes some kind of intervention and monitor the outcome. All experimental studies, clinical trials and interventional studies are all interventional studies. See, Experimental in vivo and in vitro, both are experimental studies. Clinical studies are also a type of experimental study. This is a common question for all PG scholars in vivo and uh, theory. You should clearly understand descriptive and analytical studies. Descriptive study is uh, observational case study and survey study. These descriptive studies or surveys, fact finding inquiries are included in this. Observational descriptive study method of viewing and recording the participants. You are making some interview, you are making some dialogue and documenting with the descriptive analysis. Case study in depth study of an individual or group of individuals. Survey is brief interview or discussion with an individual about a specific topic. You take one specific topic and make a uh, survey study. See, in survey study, current uh, years are very good for doing uh, clinical surveys where the incidence of COVID-19, symptomatology of COVID-19, response to modern treatment, response to Ayurvedic treatment, response to Government of India guidelines, all these things are descriptive studies. In analytical study, analyze the facts to make critical evaluation of the material. Case control study, cohort study, randomized controlled tr clinical trials, lab studies are all uh, analytical studies. You can understand cross-sectional study and longitudinal study like this. The timeline of cross-sectional study is one point in time, whereas longitudinal study is multiple points in one time. So um, on the zero day, on 15th day, 30th day, 45th day, 60th day, after follow-up, 72 days, it is multiple points in time. It is longitudinal study. The sample type in cross-sectional study is always different. Fresh sample each time is cross-sectional study. But in longitudinal study, the sample type will be the same at every interval. The results of cross-sectional studies delivers a snapshot in given point of time. In given point of time, it is delivering a snapshot result. Whereas in longitudinal study, it provides details of changes over a period of time. So there are two types of study. You will ask how many types of studies are there. There are prospective study and retrospective studies. Prospective study is after the exposure, you will start working and you will end at the outcome. 
this is called in future what you are doing this is a type of study design prospective studies are you are starting study from today and you are ending in one six months trial or eight months duration of time retrospective studies already there is an outcome results are there in the hospital result or results are available in your directories your uh, record room is having results from there you will go towards exposure and that is called uh, retrospective study clinical trials in nutshell we can do like this you make one approved protocol from uh, ethical committee now new guidelines is when you submit your synopsis for institutional ethical committee there should be a clear case record format once your protocol is approved the investigator starts selecting the uh, subject and patients or subjects he will start the approval process then patient recruitment and the participation will start data entering and then you will start revamp then you will apply to the statistical analysis once your study is completed with the data collection you will start statistical analysis then you will presentation and publication of your report you will make and finally data file and registration obtained is kept in a data file like this in total clinical trial will be having all these studies cohort study is one important aspect of study where ayurvedic researchers can concentrate on this a cohort is a small group of people who share a common characteristic or experience within a defined period i'll give an example in my colony some 20 homes are there who are having a common characteristic symptom called cough and um, rhinitis and severe fatigue it is within a period of 14 days or 12 days then it is a cohort study a small group study a group of people who were born on the same day or on a day sunday born babies if you take it is one cohort all people who are having severe body pain in two weeks it is cohort study a cohort study is a form of longitudinal observational study cohort study is used to find out an association of a particular factor with the disease process Parti participants are divided into two groups randomly and one group is exposed to risk factor under study and other group is unexposed to this factor so in a cohort study you make two groups one will be exposed to the risk factor under the study another will not be exposed to the risk factor randomized control trials are well accepted uh, clinical trials in current research era so when you are out of 20 people you are randomly choosing who are having cough as a symptom you will take every alternate person as your subject you will take every third person as your subject you will randomly pick up irrespective of caste irrespective of dwelling irrespective of the socio economic status irrespective of the race then it is called randomization randomized control trials are better than um, uh, other group of trials so for randomized controlled uh, trials comes under experimental research experimental research need not be only on animals experimental research can be done on human subjects also where the researchers do have the freedom to intervene if a research scholar is having a freedom to intervene and give some drugs then it is called experimental research the research researcher is supposed to give intervention like a medicine he can advise some diet he can tell some exercise he can ask the some uh, yoga yoga other exercises these are all called internal and external interventions rct is a study in which people are allocated at random to receive one of the several interventions see i have three groups of interventions one is basti another is uttara basti another is oral drug i have one shamana drug and i have one shodhana drug i have one shamana drug and i have one rasayana drug if i am randomly giving one patient every equal number patient i will give shodhana drug every alternate patient odd number patient i will give rasayana drug like this the allocation is random or selection is random is called randomized controlled trials we should understand something called clinical research design it's a very uh, important aspect of clinical research it is a hard in clinical research design we have two major types one is non interventional research design 
non-intentional research design is observational type where you are not giving any drug and you are observing the fact and another group we are having experimental research design where i am doing some intervention in observational group we have comparison group where one is comparison s and there is comparison no when you are not comparing it is a descriptive study when you are comparing it is analytical study case control study or cohort study you classically tell what type of clinical intervention you are doing or intervention you are not doing whether you are comparing without giving any drug you are only observing and comparing or in experimental type of clinical research design random allocation comes random allocation is s then you are doing randomized control trials if you are not doing non random allocation it is called non randomized control studies the quantitative comparative controlled experiments in which a group of investigators study two or more interventions in a series of participants who are allocated randomly to each intervention group is to be understood in random allocation to intervention group we should understand all participants have equal chance of being allocated to each intervention group see one group has got 20 patients another group has got 20 patients each participant have a equal chance of being allocated to each intervention group see patients are there number from 1 to 20 and in 1 to 20 group we may give any patient one group any patient b group so every patient is having a chance of receiving rasayana in one group or every patient in group is having a chance of shamana in group so in one group the patient is having a every chance of getting uh, allocated to intervention group is called uh, randomized clinical trial why we should do rct studies randomized control studies is to measure the effectiveness of the treatment protocol to measure the effectiveness of the treatment protocol randomization is done in randomization we are able to understand whether new intervention or new treatment is having any efficacy or not this is important the new intervention has a significant effect or that effectiveness is proved or not for this purpose we should do rct to examine the cause and effect relationship between an intervention and outcome we should do rct see karya karana vada is well accepted the clinical research in our ayurveda science so if you are examining cause and effect see for example you are giving uh, rasa raja rasa for spinal column pain and you are observing the relief in spinal column pain this cause and effect therapy proves that the effectiveness of intervention or effectiveness of rasa raja rasa between intervention and outcome when you have started intervention and when you are observing at the end of outcome days when you are doing this research it is called rct to provide an evidence based medicine now everybody says evidence based medicine is great every uh, evidence based medicine is great the whole ayurvedic literature in samhita period or after samhita period the documentation of samhita is according to me evidence based medicine our acharyas have done a clinical trial they have not done the methodology of trial they have written outcome of trial they have written the rct outcome in conclusion the samhita is a conclusion of their clinical trial they are all based on their evidence you see acharya charaka says avastika chikitsa for jwara roga many conditions he says if patient is like this give paya if patient is like this give langana if patient is like this give swedana if patient is like this you give paya or yusha when to give paya when to give yusha he has already done a rct study and he is telling only the conclusions so if you want ayurveda in next decade to be a evidence based medicine in global scenario our all research scholars must stag on to rct studies what is the objective of rct studies to explore the basic steps of randomized control trials to understand and evaluate rct and its various types of classification there are numerous classifications of rcts are there we should understand in our objective to analyze the advantages and disadvantages of the rct rct is having more advantages but rct is also having some disadvantages the meta- methodology when we start the rct we should have this methodology first is definition of rct method then design of rct method drawing up a protocol 
pilot study must be done before a final protocol selection of reference of population must be given randomization method should be said concealment of your treatment should be explained blinding technique should be told whether it is a open trial whether it is a, whether it is a single blind whether it is a double blind double blind studies are very good in rct in double blind the research scholar will not do the drug which is blinded and the even patient doesn't know what drug is given but the controlling officer guide or the staff supervisor will know the control group ethics of the uh, research should be explained manipulation and intervention is properly explained the follow up of uh, study should be explained assessment of outcome should be very clear on which objective parameters you are working and then on which subjective parameter you are telling you must be clear about more objective parameters and less subjective parameter is a very good rct study more subjective parameters and no objective parameter is is not a good rct study you should have which type of statistical analysis you are doing and what is your report outcome and where you are doing publication an experiment in which investigators randomly allocate eligible people into intervention groups to receive or not to receive one or more intervention that care being compared is called rct so you are giving allocation randomly to the eligible people uneligible people you are not giving intervention and the intervention group will receive or not receive is clearly told out of 20 patient or 1 3 5 7 9 11 will receive the drug 2 4 6 8 will not receive group a drug they will receive modern standard they will receive proved standard ayurvedic drug then it is a randomized trial it is a controlled trial the john m last settled in 2000 said an epidemiological experiment in which subjects in a population are randomly allocated into groups usually called study and control groups to receive and not receive an experimental preventive or therapeutic procedure or a maneuver or intervention is called rct the rct design is eligible people are randomly assigned into two or more groups you can make minimum two groups maximum three groups or more in experimental animal studies one group receives the trial drug while the control group receives nothing or an inactive placebo or an existing treatment so you can choose in uh, controlling group where you can do either a nothing called placebo you can give some inactive placebo or you can give already existing proved line of treatment the researchers then study the effect in participants of each group the researcher will observe what is the effect of trial group upon the existing standard group then both are compared is rct in the rct design you can see subjects meeting entry criteria who are fit for your study you will make them group then you make them two groups one is experimental subjects another is control subject the experimental subject will have with outcome and without outcome two again in the experimental group one will have with outcome group another is not having any outcome group in control group again with outcome and without outcome the onset of the study intervention and the time duration is very important firstly the onset of the study is there the shukra janaka effect of kushta churna where the intervention started and the time duration is 60 to 72 days or 90 days as per the physiology then this clarity should be there from the onset of the study to the time allocation in the rct study how will you draw up a protocol protocol is the blueprint of this totally when you are constructing a house you will submit a blueprint to the authorities of government in the same way you are submitting blueprint to the institutional ethical committee after passing that you are submitting to the university a detailed protocol as per the gcp guidelines should be prepared good clinical practice guidelines are available on the on the net the student can go through that your protocol should be as per the good clinical practice guidelines firstly you should have pilot study on a small scale preliminary study conducted before the main research in order to check the feasibility or to improve the design of the research before submitting the synopsis in 15 days or one month you do some pilot study upon five or six subjects you do preliminary study and then you understand what is the feasibility of the group and what is the dose what is the duration what is the outcome you will understand pilot study gives a lot of practical inputs in patient care follow up adverse effects methodology and finance etc the final protocol may be finalized by making necessary changes after observing the pilot study and i always suggest pilot studies are must before submitting the synopsis 
selection of reference population how will you select is this is one of the important aspect of clinical research design precise definition of participants is a must in clinical trial you first define who are your participants the patient who are having sperm count less than 15 million the patient who are having the three criteria of covid-19 rhinitis upper respiratory infection cough and body pain like this you define your participant validated diagnostic criteria should be used for the purpose so you first tell what are the diagnostic criteria routine blood test x rays ultrasound scans these are all validated diagnostic criteria the patient with accurate exacerbation of chronic sinusitis osteoporosis due to hysterectomy should be your diagnostic criteria selection of a experimental population the study sample should be selected following a well defined inclusion and exclusion criteria for your disease for your clinical condition you thoroughly decide inclusion and exclusion criteria otherwise your experimental population will be biased that is the bias during experimental population selection appropriate sampling techniques must be used to make sample a true representative of population the sampling techniques and calculation of sample size has got a molecular formula a small formula is there if your population is 2% of the incidence of your population your city is having 6 lakh population out of that 10000 people are suffering with your disease then that sample test will give you the exact sampling size of your patient then that will be similar after proving of your outcome you have selected n number of population size which will represent the whole population that is the purpose of telling sample sizing and sample techniques randomization is the cardinal feature of rct in each subject has an equal chance of being in the intervention group or control group see out of 40 patients or 100 patients every patient has got a chance this is yadrucha as a chance of being either he will come into intervention group or he may come into the control group every patient has got this chance there are two processes involved in the randomizing participants to different intervention one is randomization of the procedure and allocation of concealment so randomization of the procedure is a simple randomization assignment of the patients to any of the groups at equal possibility probability may be restricted or may be adaptive you can use the patient by restricted entry or adaptive entry what is allocation concealment is the procedure for protecting randomization process so that the treatment to be allocated is not informed in advance this is called allocation concealment you will tell the patient that ayurvedic treatment we will give what exactly drug we are giving or what exactly the name of the drug we will not inform the patient we will tell that it is a research product it is an approved product it is a scientific product but we will not tell the name of that product it is called allocated is not informed in advance you can tell later okay the stringent precautions taken to ensure that the group assignments of patients are not revealed prior to the definitely allocating them to their respective groups you will not tell prior to the allocation okay only after taking the history and examination the sequence of that participant will be revealed to the investigator so once you take a thorough history and examine the patient the sequence of that participant whether he will come in standard group whether he will come in trial group will be told by investigator the blinding tactics this is one of the short notes in the examination in rct we call it as blinded also called masked masking by procedures that prevent study participants or caregivers or outcome assessors from knowing which intervention was received we will give two same colored product so that the investigator will not know what exact drug is group is given so that he will genuinely work on the group and the outcome will be very good assessed by the accessor the blinding are of three important types one is single blind where investigator knows and the recipient will not know the drug in the double blind the investigator research scholar will not know and the recipient blind, uh, subject will not know only the guide or supervisor will know that the triple blind is the guide research scholar and the recipient will not do the head of the institution will know the triple blind drug so rcts without blinding are re referred to as unblinded or open trials when you are doing unblinded then it is called open trial if the intervention is a medication 
you tell open labeled studies open label studies patient know that you are giving sarpaganda churna you are giving kushta churna you are giving kilataila uh, lasya you are giving maharasna uh, dikshayam like that when you do it is called open labeled studies control studies what is control studies define the control with no ambiguity you tell which is the control group the intervention either positive or negative control must be justified ethically the concurrent control the size and number the single or multiple number should be mentioned you are, you should tell the size of the concurrent group or number of the concurrent control group should be expressed other controls the historical or geographical details should be expressed ethics there are ethics in uh, rct studies care must be taken to follow all ethical guidelines throughout the study appropriate informed consent must be obtained from the participant see in the ethics of the study you should declare that in your inclusion you should tell that the patient who gives informed consent only will be taken to the trial if the person fails to give informed consent he will not be assigned into the trial group copy of the consent and information sheet must be attached to the case record format so you should give in triple language one is standard english another is national language third is local language you can give triple language consent form or informed consent and then it should be attached to the case record format intervention what is the meaning of intervention the details of the intervention in both groups must be prepared with precision the dose duration and anupana of the trial drug and control should be included in the protocol intervention means what you are giving to the subject what you are giving to the giving something to the subject medication to the subject it is called intervention the changes in the lifestyle you are telling food habits you are telling are also to be mentioned in the intervention my dear friends many of the protocols or synopsis miss this but definitely you should tell what change in the lifestyle you are telling according to your disease you should tell you are telling this 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 lifestyle modification you will be telling this food habits will be allowed you, this food habits will be restricted this must be explained in your clinical trial protocol uh, or synopsis format the follow up detailed plan of follow up must be specified see many of the clinical trial they don't tell follow up at all follow up is that period where you are not giving the drug and you are observing the subject for certain period one or two weeks or three weeks as the case may be and you will observe after stopping the drug for 15 days what is the effect of your intervention what is the good effect or bad effect you will observe you will tell that even after stopping the drug for 15 days the follow up patient comes to you and says that after stopping the drug also patient is having some improvement we will take semen analysis at the end of the study of the trial drug and after 15 days we'll take another semen sample we notice that even after stopping the drug there is a change in intervention group or control group or any group the identity of evaluators and frequency of assessment and the criteria should be explained in this title assessment of outcome this is very important you declare in your synopsis what is your outcome assessment outcome assessment is it is defined properly in the protocol there can be multiple outcome there can be one outcome or two outcome you tell i want to assess the outcome of my clinical trial in terms of sperm count in terms of sperm motility in terms of sperm morphology in terms of improvement in systolic blood pressure in terms of improvement in diastolic blood pressure in non clinical studies like improvement in the weight of the drug improvement in color of the drug improve improvement in smell of the drug these are all definite outcomes after dhanyabrak nirmana what is your outcome of observation details of the evaluators frequency of assessment and criteria should be explained in abrak vasma nirmana you tell at the end of 10 bus, 10 putas 20 putas 30 putas at the end of 100 puta at the end of 1000 puta in the same way in clinical trial at the end of one month at the end of two months at the end of 45 days whatever time period you are telling the frequency of assessment zero day 30th day 60th day zero day 15th day 30th day 45th day like this you tell assessment of your outcome then analysis you clearly write in your analysis what you are doing test for normality is the first assessment in ours whether your outcome is analyzed for normal normality curve distribution 
before going into the outcome analysis we must assure that the groups were comparable so in one group you have got assessment of normality of 20 patient in another group also 20 patient equal group is first assessed the n should be e parallelly matched in one group you have 10 patient in another group 100 patient this normality distribution is not there all baseline parameters in both group must be compared for equality see in one group you are assessing hb in another group you are assessing uh, uh, iron profile this is not correct the baseline parameters of hb ecg tmt 2d echo sperm analysis all these base parameters should be compared in both groups usually in two arm studies in one arm trial group in another arm arm is not your hand arm is one group and arm is another group in trial arm what you are doing in standard arm what you are doing then you are doing unpaired t test when sample size is less than, uh, less than or equal to 30 if your sample size is more than t 30 then you can go for chi, chi square test and other tests in many studies the investigator make the claim based on percentage of improvement of, of course you can do before treatment after treatment you can take mean values of your outcome mean mean systolic blood pressure was 180 before and mean um, blood pressure systolic score after the treatment is 160 then bt minus 80 by bt into 100 you can tell percentage of improvement this is also one of the analysis you can tell i will analyze the percentage of improvement you declare that this type of numerical significance is not accepted in scientific research appropriate statistical test like t test z test anova test chi square test etc may be chosen for the analysis if your groups are having three or more than three then anova test is coming either one day anova or multiple anova should be explained if your sample size is 30 then you can tell t test paired or unpaired as the case may be and if your uh, sample size is more than 30 then you can take about z test chi square test like this so you tell what are the analysis you are making you do one normality test will be done second is baseline parameters in both groups will be assessed and compared and in third point you will make percentage of improvement fourth step you will do appropriate statistical test for this you take help of statistician before submitting synopsis then before submitting to iec then declare this in the university format where in 7.2 and 3 we ask then you take a certification from statistician that the statistician gives a authenticated letter that the scholar has discussed thoroughly and he has approved the statistical method report generation on the basis of calculation a report should be prepared with need of transparent complete and an unambiguous report it should be transparent see that's why in the morning professor srinivas prasad our board president was telling he said that e crf should be prepared once you upload your data into the e crf it will be transparent and complete it will be unambiguous and you cannot modify you cannot change or you cannot do something like that the tables charts and figures should be included as and when required for your effective report generation make tables charts and figures nowadays many softwares are available you can use software statistical report generation is made easy so publication publication is important part of uh, any clinical research and publish or perish is the common rule in research you publish or perish nowadays perish as dr akash kembavi was critically rightly telling and dr supriya was critically uh, doing this perishing type of uh, publication research is done for the mankind hence it has to be published so you do research and you publish in the interest of mankind without publication see many publications are there for university of national university or state universities but it is not to the use of end users like ug students or pg students see abracabasma trials have been done animal studies have been done abragarba portally has been tried but the ug or pg student of rashastra will not know what is the outcome of abragarba portally so for that purpose published article should come into the textbook i repeat the, the public ug or pg or phd scholars or practitioners then only the clinical research is complete i repeat this word so that the policy makers will think about this 
every researcher should publish the data in scientific journals approved journals now government of india and the central council has given a, a guideline that it should be ugc approved scientific journals must be selected by the researcher to publish so the publication policy should be mentioned in the protocol in the synopsis you tell the university publication will be approved or uh, scientific journals peer reviewed journals will be uh, selected for publication the consort 200 2010 statement is an evidence based minimum set of recommendation for reporting rct is available in consort guidelines for ug student uh, pg students this consort guidelines is in one of the syllabus point so based on consort guidelines we should make a statement that on which platform we are going to publish the classifications of uh, studies are like this based on study design parallel group crossover group cluster group and factorial group in parallel group what we do is each participant is randomly assigned to a group and all the participant in the group will receive or do not receive the as the case may be the intervention in a crossover study over time each participant receives uh, a group and intervention in a random sequence see there are two groups firstly patient will receive group a drug after a period of time once this trial is completed the same patient will be given the another group trial this is called crossover study yes this is also one of the best study in the cluster study pre existing groups of participants that is villages and schools are randomly selected to receive an intervention in a cluster you will select from the slum area schools will be selected the village people will be selected the ksrtc employees will be selected the bank employees will be selected this is called cluster studies in the factorial group we can also tell cluster studies like uh, the people who are dwelling in old age homes will be selected this is a cluster study factorial study is each participant is randomly assigned to a group that receive a particular combination of the trial or intervention this is called factorial study for ayurveda this factorial research is also very good factorial study design is also very excellent based on outcome of interest efficacy of our effectiveness we can also make some out of interest and like allocate the group explanatory study test efficacy in a research setting with highly selected participant and under highly controlled condition is called explanatory studies pragmatic study is the test effect effectiveness in study practice with relatively unselected participant under flexible conditions then we call it as pragmatic clinical research based on hypothesis we make h0 hypothesis we make h1 hypothesis we make h2 hypothesis null hypothesis or h0 hypothesis is we declare in the beginning that the intervention is not effective in the treatment of so and so condition the alternate hypothesis the, the null hypothesis is made for rejection if you reject the null hypothesis at the end of your trial your drug is accepted the alternative hypothesis is made for accepting at the end of your outcome if alternate hypothesis is accepted your trial drug is approved and if your alternate hypothesis is rejected your drug is also rejected in the h2 receptor you are going to tell group a is better than group b or group b is better than group c or group a is better than a and c like this when you do we call it as hypothesis testing for superiority versus non inferiority or equivalence both group have equivalent uh, uh, results yeah. we call superiority trials are one intervention is hypothesis to be superior to another uh, uh, intervention statistically significant way non inferiority trials are to determine whether a new treatment is no worse than a reference treatment already the patient is taking one uh, standard drug if your drug is also not worse than what is uh, ongoing then it is called non inferiority trial equivalence trials are the hypothesis is that two interventions are indistinguishable so group a and group b are similarly giving result like uh, ashwagandha ganavati and guduchi ganavati both are having significant similar effect in the management of covid 19 cases then we call it as equivalence trials open trials and blind uh, randomized clinical trials open rct and blind rct blind is single blind double blind triple blind on the basis of phases so you have a standard phases of clinical trial pre clinical phase 0 trial phase 1 trial phase 2 trial phase 3 trial and phase 4 trial actually we should have these phase wise trials but fortunately for our ayurvedic trials which are already proved scientific ayurvedic documented classical drugs then you can start phase 4 trials overview of a clinical trial after study design you are notifying the regular authority in the institutional committee then design and study 
and documents you are making then investigator is doing selection and uh, then patient is subjected to ethical committee review after approval letter you are starting investigator invention then you are doing site of location and you are doing monitoring either patient enrollment or data management or you can do to the follow up visits you can do to the end of trial at the end of the trial you can start a statistical review and final report making players in the clinical trial first is regulator sponsor clinical research organizer medical director project manager cra and he is called assistant regulatory personnel then investigator or sub investigator and then it is going to be again a clinical research assistant applications of rct one is equivalent equal evaluation of treatment evaluation of prevention or evaluation of health programs in three areas rcts are selected one is for chemotherapy or surgical therapies or chemo prophylaxis or immuno prophylaxis gudu chadi ganavati or gudu chi pipali ganavati as immuno prophylaxis in post covid patients and evaluation of health programs health care services and patient education programs nowadays post covid 19 uh, protocols are uh, told by university parameters so we have to work on this evaluation of health programs evaluation of health care services advantages of rcts are considered by most to be the most reliable form of scientific evidence in the hierarchy of evidence that influences health care policy and practice because rct reduce spurious and uh, casualty and bias there are less bias in rct it is avoiding spurious uh, casualties it is having a good health care policy and practice hence these three are advantages of rct results of rct may be combined in systematic reviews which are increasingly being used in the conduct of evidence based practice theoretically these are all attractive control confounding bias is observed strong evidences are available it is going to allow to the meta analysis that's why we are telling that rct is good disadvantage disadvantages of rct are the problems in dealing with multiple causation isolating individual factors may over simplify complex issues ethical issues are very tough in rct rct is very costly type of uh, clinical trial it takes longer time it there is a researcher bias you can put patient in always group a P- patient is always taken to group b to prove that your trial drug is better than standard drug so subjectivity in research design methods and analysis is the uh, difficulty in rct the hawthorne effect upon uh, groups being researched in rct so hierarchy of evidence it generates hypothesis to the established casualty so this is hierarchy from expert opinion after expert opinion case studies after case studies will go to uncontrolled cohort studies after that controlled cohort studies after that randomized control trials and then the scientific reviews this is the hierarchy of evidence black box design is the best design for clinical ayurvedic trials based on chikitsa siddhanta of ayurveda as it is without the changing the ayurvedic intention we can do black box design what is black box design is you give input in the black box you are telling what are all you are doing you will tell that how you are assessing you are not telling you will also assess output outcome so you are giving trial and you are observing the outcome is called black box design what as modern design is they do input and they go in depth into the where drug has gone what a drug is doing how many hours drug is in the body how many hours drug is uh, um, thrown out from the body whether it is thrown out completely or not in which cell it is going in which cell it is not entering these are all studied not in black box design so how drug is working is not the black box design it is working it is the before treatment uh, assessment after treatment assessment we are telling that the intervention is effective the subjective and um, objective parameters are improved time master in viva voice and theory examination in the science a black box design is a device or it is a system or it is an object which can be viewed in terms of inputs and outputs without any knowledge of internal working you you tell that the so and so drug for example guruchadi kashayam or badra mustadi kashayam or nagaradi kashayam is effective in controlling the covid 19 symptoms okay tribun kirti rasa lakshmi vilas rasa and jai mangal rasa are effective in treating the patients of covid 19 we don't know how it is working no animal studies nothing patient is improving 3 days we have done lot of clinical experiences where as per the guidelines of government of india 
we are giving jai mangala rasa mahalakshmi vilas rasa and uh, nagaradi kashayam or we are giving the jai mangala rasa and uh, uh, swarnamalini vasanta rasa and the dashamula kadatriyadi kashayam to the patient we see that at the end of 3 days at the end of 5 days the patient oxygen saturation is improving quality of life is improving symptoms are regressing how drug is working is not black box design drug is working uh, upon the parameters we can tell that it is a black box design so population to sampling in between, population to sample we do sampling first is population who are the people suffering is population out of which how many people you are selecting for the study see in uh, mysore we are having 10000 people affected with covid 19 you cannot go every day to 10000 patients and go treatment and assess them so you will take a small sample out of it see when you are going to check the um, for example you are checking the deodorant spray you will take one small sample out of it and study that this uh, deodorant spray is good like that out of a big sample size sample uh, people out of it and we do try sampling is a process of selecting representative units from an entire population it is not always possible to study entire population therefore a researcher draws a representative part of population so in one world what is sampling it is choosing a representative part of a population through sampling process or sampling techniques it is a process of obtaining information regarding phenomenon about entire population so types of sampling methods one is probability sampling another is non probability sampling so probability sampling utilizes random sampling techniques to create a sample this group of sampling methods give all the members of a population equal chances of being selected probability sampling is each population in the group will have a every chance of being selected is probable sampling in non probability sampling it is a group of sampling technique where the samples are collected in a way that does not give all units in the population equal chances of being selected probability sampling is better than random selection to all so we usually choose probability sampling probability sampling is simple random sampling non probability sampling is purpose sampling probability sampling is stratified sam random sampling and non probability sampling is convenient sampling so probability sampling is systematic sampling and non probability sampling is snowball sampling probability sampling is cluster sampling non probability sampling is quota sampling the probability sampling is multi static sampling <clears throat> so what can we bring in the study is random error is chance systematic error is bias this is a question asked in uh, short notes what is chance and what is bias random error is a chance and systematic error is a bias i'll tell you in detail the in random error results in low precision of the epidemiological measure to measure is not precise but true see random error is measure is not precise but it is a true error in this random error imprecise measuring is there two small groups are there it decreases with increasing group size if you increase the group size random error will decrease if your number of samples are good and more then random error will be less so the repeating uh, it is a group size and repeating test can be quantified by confidence interval if your confidence interval is used you can reduce random error the systemic error is results in low validity internal or external validity is very low of the epidemiological measure the measure is not true so whereas random error is measure is not true systemic error is also measure is not true the problem in systemic error is there is a selection bias there is a information bias there is a confounding so it does not decrease with confounding does not decrease with increasing the group size even though you are increasing the group size the systemic error will not decrease that's why you should know random error and you should also know systematic error potential source of error in estimating a population distribution using a sample sampling error is sampling error and non sampling errors are there sampling error is because the sample is not the whole population if your sample is not depicting the whole sample then it is a sample error non sampling error is poor sampling method questionnaire method or behavioral effects then it is non sampling error where bias can bias can happen it can happen in four ways one is study design there is a bias if you have done the study design bias then there is a problem in data collection also bias takes place when you are taking wrong timely data collection then also it is bias 
process of data analysis you are doing wrong data analysis then also it is bias and in publication also you can do bias we, if you have your own publication bias your research work is not up to the mark or standard sources of bias one is exposure another is classification bias selection bias selection errors or uh, uh, questionnaire errors or even uh, non inferential errors bias cohort case control bias uh, so many bias. length of bias rapidly progressive disease is there then screening test you are doing in between then it is a rapidly progressive disease bias if it is slowly progressive bias then also it, the screening test is done very slowly in the advanced stage then clinical onset of the disease is having length bias or case detected by screening bias or case missed by the screened bias new concept in clinical trial adaptive clinical trial the trial that evaluates patients reactions to a drug beginning early in the clinical trial and modify the trial in accordance with those findings if you are doing prior to the approval of new drug substantial evidence of the efficacy is required and safety brought through clinical trials good clinical practice is also a short notes and important area of the research clinical research the good clinical practice is a set of guidance uh, guidelines which includes the design conduct termination audit analysis reporting and documentation of the studies involving human subjects ayurveda has emphasized much on ethical guidelines while treating a patient through medical or surgical intervention so to conclude the individual patients are randomly allocated to receive the experimental treatment or intervention group control group gold standard of research designs are available the maximizes the rct maximizes the potential of attribution it is having good internal validity rct is having good internal validity so it should be decided highly selected participants may lead to lack of generaliz generalizability in rct the generalizability is very less so it is very good for highly selected participants the rct can be costly to set up a conduct or ethical issues well conducted double blind randomized control trials are gold standard for studies of efficacy so you should do double blind you should do randomized and you should do control then definitely this study is called very very good study in evidence based medicine in rct minimize bias minimize bias are there and maximize attribution is there so with this i come to the conclusion of my talk in a nutshell i have concluded i have uh, um, covered many of the areas of clinical research this is not entire about clinical research i have given only titles of clinical research there is lot of things to express or explain in clinical trials but in a given period of time i have tried to explain you about the uh, what is the uh, research what is the clinical research how to prepare a clinical research how to um, make some evidence based approaches in clinical research and also many areas of uh, understanding randomization and also areas of uh, making more evidence based research in ayurvedic pg studies in phd studies you should go in very depth of uh, clinical research and if you are doing a research for an industry or research for the organization then the clinical research requires a still more explanation i think i have taken a very apt time and i have finished on time in this uh, regard and i am thankful to organizers and all three college management principals and uh, staff members and hods for uh, making this uh, very very good event i think all three government colleges in united for one cause it is a golden standard where we are doing a unbiased uh, trial this is an unbiased trial we have done in in collaboration in in cooperation so um, like this uh, trial should continue uh, we can make still better uh, uh, webinars in coming days and thank you one and all namaste thank you sir we have few questions in chat box hello sir the gavi sir can i ask those questions yes yes tell me is that a necessity that a drug of formulation to be given in control group is standardized what should be done to com uh, compare efficacy of two formulations that is already in clinical practice in clinical trials see if you are putting a proved formulation as a whole as per the text 
then you can definitely put it as a comparative group but if it is in the practice but not researched out then you can take for example lakshmi vilasa rasa is in practice for covid 19 so because it is in practice you can take it as a study material or a study group and then you can go for comparative studies no no trouble in that but that formulation should be ethically selected but you should be uh, having proper review of that drug if proper review is not available you cannot take some articles some publications some diaries you take some interview of 10 doctors who are practicing that drug the formulation is practiced by 10 practitioners you make a interview with them and document you put some questionnaire to them which is already a formulated drug they are using you put some questionnaires based on that you take a standard group and do the trial no issues in that thank you thank you sir another question is how objective parameters like ct or mri is better than subjective parameters see subjective parameters will not give you statistically accessible evidence based standards subjective means i am telling patient has improved markedly but you are telling patient has not improved markedly i will ask the patient how are you i have given free of medicine i have given free diet in government hospital patient says sir i am okay sir 50% better to satisfy me patient says better and the research scholar want to finish the pg research he says sir my patient has improved markedly my patient 30 patients are there 10 improved markedly 10 improved mildly 10 improved uh, in a good quality so this is going to have a bias in assessment that's why see we have done a clinical trial where the opacities are there in the lungs after covid 19 so ct scan or hrct of the thorax is taken before and after treatment if you send it to the hrct and if the radiologist says before treatment ct shows opacities and after this treatment there is no opacity at all then the intervention is very specific very strong evident and you can uh, you can calculate the statistical significance that's why subjective parameters will give you improvement but the scoring pattern parameters will have bias for that purpose ct x ray objective parameters blood tests or measurable parameters then it is more scientific ayurvedic drug is giving definitely result but if you don't assess on objective parameters its validity comes down for example i have seen every person who takes jayamangala rasa in the jara of covid 19 will definitely respond i tell you this much then the scientific community will not believe this sir you are telling patient is taking paracetamol and jayamangala rasa together we don't know which has worked for that purpose paracetamol should be kept as a standard drug and jayamangala drug then do a comparative standard rct double blind studies then you are able to tell whether paracetamol is better than jayamangala ras or jayamangala ras is better than paracetamol i have seen the standard drug paracetamol working with jayamangala ras also we have seen and we have seen jayamangala ras alone with paracetamol also we have seen and in some of the cases jayamangala ras is alone better than paracetamol then we are able to give some statistical analysis evidence based validities it is not the right time to open my data because we have very less small data we have to do work still more in coming years then we are able to tell objective parameter based numerical statistical mathematical analysis is gold standard when it is rct with double blind studies or triple blind studies and that to multi centric rct studies with double blind design is more accurate we will go into the more accurate scientific uh, validation then our drug is accepted more by scientific community otherwise subjective improvement is also improvement objective parameter improvement is also improvement only it makes difference in the scientific validation with numerical data thank you oh, thank you sir now i request dr hitesh second year pg scholar department of swastha prita to thank dr digavi sir and to conclude the session what is this necessary good afternoon everyone 
thank you sir for giving us an elaborate and a simpler uh, uh, a way of uh, uh, information it is also in, important in terms of uh, our exams of course you said uh, it will be uh, asked for 20 marks but uh, i think you have covered more than 40 marks sir uh, this <laughs> piece of recording is also important for us uh, during the time of our exams i thank you and also i take this opportunity to thank thank uh, all the resource persons of today uh, coincidentally today it was the day of uh, alumni of ipgt r and a uh, as you oh. rightly pointed out uh, right from the keynote addresser and uh, all the three resource person and also the man behind uh, the hosting uh, team dr shrivas sir is also from uh, uh, ipgt r and a uh, yes. thank True. you everyone uh, thanks uh, for uh, giving uh, your precious time for us sir uh, we are we are we are really blessed to be your students uh, thank you one and all thank you and, uh, uh, and uh, regarding tomorrow's session uh, it will be hosted by uh, GM, uh, tgmc ballari and it uh, rightly starts uh, as usual at 10 am be ready that's all for today thank you